from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello. Um, I am Abby Potter. I'm uh, with the Library of Congress Labs team, and we're really happy to um, host the um, HTRC and their um, text mining workshop today. This is a topic we're very interested in. We, uh, the library also has, uh, like I'm sure many of your institutions, has loads of um, copyrighted or restricted materials, and we're always interested to find ways to uh, use that and uh, make it useful to our users. So um, we're really looking forward to this workshop. So I will turn it over to Harriet and uh, she will get us started. Is that right? Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so we love to, uh, we really like to thank uh, Abby and Jamie Mears for inviting us here at the Library of Congress. Uh, so we're really excited to talk with you today uh, about Hathi Trust and, digital, and text mining and how you as librarians uh, can start to engage in this research. So um, just uh, as we, um, just to start out with a quick, we're gonna do introductions that again, as Abby said, won't be filmed. Um, my name is Harriet Green. Uh, I'm at the PI for this project, uh, and I'll be accompanied by, uh, well, Kota teaching with Eleanor Dixon, also from the University of Illinois, uh, and Amanda Hinley from the University of North Carolina, and she'll be circulating. Uh, so definitely keep an eye out uh, for Amanda uh, as you go through the process and you need uh, help. Uh, so just to give a quick introduction about the project itself and, and kind of the context that we're uh, doing this work today. Um, so we received a grant from the IMLS about in 2015 uh, to carry out this project that's really aimed at empowering librarians to engage with digital scholarship and giving you the basic foundational tools and skills uh, to start engage, uh, talking with faculty, working with faculty uh, in any context that you work in. Uh, so that we're not just thinking about digital scholarship librarians, but subject liaisons, technical services librarians, archivists, all contexts that librarians are starting to engage with digital scholarship. Um, so you can see uh, all of you should have visited our website by this point, uh, teach.hcrc.illinois.edu. Um, and these are the goals, the formal goals that we stated for the project. Again, this workshop's aimed to arm you with some instructional content as well as tool skills. So everything that you downloaded today, all the slides, all the materials, they're here for you to use. So we really love to hear your stories afterward of how you're actually using this content as well to teach and, and work with uh, students and faculty. Uh, and then kind of the larger goals, um, empowering librarians to become research partners on digital projects. And we'll do some discussions throughout the day to think about that, and then thinking about as digital scholarship centers and services are emerging on your campuses, you know, enabling you to start engaging with those uh, centers and all the different initiatives that are happening on a lot of our campuses. So first and foremost, we want to thank the team that put this workshop together, that put all the materials together. So it certainly isn't just me, and it's not just me, uh, not just Eleanor or Amanda, uh, but a whole cohort of people. So um, in addition, the co-PIs are Angela Courtney from Indiana, uh, Stephen Downey from the School of Information Sciences at Illinois, uh, Therese Heidenwolf from Lafayette College, uh, Jeff Morse for Northwestern and Amanda for North Carolina. And that also highlights that we're not just coming from a research library perspective, there's a nice array of types of libraries that we're coming from as we created this workshop curriculum. So we're trying to account for all the different types of library contexts that you'll be working in. And then the project members are really the backbone of this work. Uh, in particular, I wanna highlight Eleanor along with Leanne uh, Ney and Roha Han, because they wrote this curriculum. So they did a lot of the hard work to put this material together, so I really want to uh, thank them as well. Uh, so this is our first module that's going to really give you an introduction to text analysis and thinking about what it is, giving you a, kind of a larger framework, and then we're also going to talk about uh, the Hathi Trust and the Hathi Trust Research Center uh, that we'll be working with uh, today as well. Um, so again, this module will talk about text analysis, what it means to do uh, workflows with text analysis. Uh, we'll then talk a little bit about the Hathi Trust and the Hathi Trust Research Center and the context that we'll be using uh, to start thinking about text analysis with this resource. And then we'll also introduce the hands-on example and case study that we'll be using throughout the day that will again give you a framework and reference point for how text analysis works and how you as librarians can also uh, start to work with text analysis. 
So first of all, what is text analysis? So let's start with just the basics. Uh, so what it is in the, the de definition that we'll be using uh, is that text analysis is a subset of data mining and data analysis. And by, broadly speaking, it's the process by which computers are used to reveal information in and about text. And we took this definition from Marty Hurst, a 2003 article that you can uh, see in our provided bibliography, both at the end of the slides and on our website. Um, so what we, with text analysis, computer algorithms can discern patterns in and about the text, um, often when it's bodies of unstructured text. Uh, and unstructured means that little is known about the semantic meaning of the text data, and it doesn't fit a defined data model or database. So an algorithm, algorithm and we'll revisit this again later uh, today, is simply a process by which, uh, a computational process by which output is created from certain input. So in text analysis, the input is the text, and then the algorithm works on the text, and the output would be indicators to help you discern patterns about that text. And text analysis is more about search. It's not just search and discovery, but it's also that something is present in that text. So it's exploring what does it mean for that, that pattern, for that thing to be there. So for example, knowing that creativity appears X number of times in a text is only the first step. We then want to know what the patterns about its appearance tell us about culture, tell us about history, uh, et cetera. And text analysis can be used in a variety of purposes, and actually each of you in your everyday lives have probably encountered text analysis in many different contexts. So in a scholarly realm, uh, it's been used to uh, analyze scientific literature and pick up trends in medical research to discern things that might have happened that otherwise you don't see in uh, individual articles or just in a year span of uh, medical literature. But it can also be used in developing tools. So in your email, when you, the, the spam that your email picks up and tosses into another folder, that's using text analysis because it's discerning patterns in emails to say, this is a rogue email, it's not useful, I'm gonna put it in the spam folder. So we're, each, we're all um, interacting with text analysis actually every day. So how does text analysis work in general? So text analysis usually follows these pr uh, basic steps. So first, the text needs to be transformed into a form that human readers are familiar with, into something that the computer can quote unquote read. So this means that we often need to break apart the text into smaller pieces and reduce it, and what we call abstracting it, into something that the computer can read and crunch um, through algorithms. And then counting is what happens next. So often the computer will count words, phrases of speech, uh, uh, parts of speech, uh, different whatever you define it to be, so that it can start processing the text. And these, and these counts are used to identify characteristics of the text. And then the researchers apply the algorithms, often, they, often computational statistics, to develop hypotheses based on the patterns they're seeing from those counts in the text. So how does this impact research? So again, let's think about the broader context of what does this mean for text analysis to be used in research? So in general, uh, text analysis enables a shift in perspective of the researcher, which leads to a shift in their research questions. Uh, and so this is often called distant reading. And this is a phrase coined by Franco Moretti, a Stanford professor, uh, meaning that when you do distant reading, you're not just reading literature by studying particular texts, which is uh, traditional for close reading, but by aggregating and analyzing massive amounts of texts and, quote, reading them from a distance. So the scaling up and this distancing can bring out more insights, but from a very different vantage point. And it's also worth mentioning that text analysis is not the end all be all. It's really one step in the research process. And it, it can be combined often with close reading. And this is what we might call um, intermediate reading or distant close reading. And the shift in research perspective then allows for shifts in research questions. So that old questions can sometimes be answered in new ways. Uh, so some of the possibilities that text analysis open up is questions that you can't prove by doing human reading alone. A human can't read a million books in one sitting or even years of sitting. Uh, so what, how, how do we enable computers to help us with that? And by that token, it allows larger corporate for analysis by uh, aggregating and analyzing mass amounts of text. And then it allows for text, uh, textual studies that cover longer time spans as well, again, by aggregating and analyzing those larger corpora of text. 
text analysis research um, explores a wide range of topics, um, as, and we heard from some of these examples, um, address certain issues. So from biomedical discovery to literary history uh, to religious history, uh, but the re and what really comes down to uh, is the research question itself, and the research questions that are particularly conducive to text analysis methods often involve these characteristics. So one is change over time, so are we seeing uh, changes, uh, pattern recognition, and identifying patterns that might be useful to know, and then comparative analysis as well. So how are works, um, you know, identifying uh, different changes in works or interesting things and comparing these works. Uh, so let's look at some real world examples uh, that show these characteristics. Um, as well as demonstrate impacts on the research that we um, discussed earlier. Uh, so let's take about uh, three, four minutes, and in your tables, or you can turn around, um, you can go to this URL, go.illinois.edu, uh, and then look at the research examples. We have three uh, research uh, types, of, types of research questions with text analysis, and discuss you know, how, what do these projects involve, change over time, pattern recognition and or comparative analysis, what kind of text data do they use, and what are their findings. So let's uh, take a minute to go through these and just kind of discuss a bit more um, and maybe verify what you guys thought um, about which, what, what are the answers to these questions. So the first example that we looked at uh, was a well-known example, uh, and it's using a method that we call stylometry. And so involved, uh, when cuckoos kept, Calling by Robert Galbraith was published in 2013, people wondered if the book was actually written by J.K. Rowling. Um, so the research question is, did J.K. Rowling write The Cuckoo's Calling under the pen name Robert Galbraith? And that's kind of impossible to prove just by reading the book. Um, and so as we heard earlier with another question, you get the sense that, hmm, maybe something's here, but you're not entirely certain. Um, so it involves comparative analysis. Did anybody get that? and uh, comparing Cuckoo's Calling with other books by J.K. Rowling, and then recognizing patterns between her writing and the writing that's in Cuckoo's Calling. Uh, and you see at the citation at the bottom is the full study uh, by Patrick Drolla, and he was the scholar to explore this question. So what he did uh, is that human reading led to a hunch about the authorship question. Then Patrick Drolla conducted a stylometry analysis to complete a computational comparison of diction between the book and others written by Rowling, uh, the Harry Potter series. So by comparing a set of linguistic variables between the text of Cuckoo's Calling, four other texts, one by Rowling and three others by other authors, so it's distractor texts, uh, the results suggested that J.K. Rowling's style was the closest to Cuckoo's Calling. And so this provided a ton of a statistical proof of an authorial fingerprint. And Rowling then admitted that yes, she actually did write the book. Any questions about that one? The next one is uh, a question that may come up actually pretty often and, and when you're working with researchers is um, may want to explore the question, what are themes common in 19th century literature? Again, this question is impossible because you need to read a very large corpus of 19th century literature that's impossible to do with human reading. So Matt Jockers and David Mimno uh, explored this question in uh, their paper in 2012. And this is a, and so it involves recognition of thematic patterns in the writing and then comparative analysis. Uh, so what they did, this is their approach, they, uh, to explore the themes, uh, they ran large quantities of text through a statistical algorithm to discover what we call topics, and we're gonna talk about this a little later today. But topic modeling, just to talk about in this context, is based on the idea that words that co-occur are more likely to be related about the same thing, so that co-occurring words that the computer picks out are represented as topics. And so here's a visualization of one of their results. So it's a word cloud, uh, like a wordle, that consists of a theme that they identified algorithmically. So this is one that's labeled female fashion. So we see gown, silk, dress, lace, ribbon. So these are words that tended to co-occur across the corpus of text that they were analyzing. And so through these results, Jockers and Mimno were able to argue that authors from this time period wrote a lot about what women wore, among other things. So any questions about that one? And then the last example that we, we looked at uh, was um, what textual characteristics constitute literary language. 
and this is a good one for looking at with text analysis because it covers a very large time span of looking at a breadth of literature. Um, so it explores both change over time as well as patterns. And so Ted Underwood and Jordan Sellers use classification algorithms to study what characteristics uh, ca constitute literary language. So what they did is their approach is to show the difference in words used in poetry, drama, and fiction with those used in nonfiction prose to demonstrate how literary language developed over time. So they trained a computational model to recognize literary genres, and then they compared which words were most frequently used over time in nonfiction prose versus literary genres. And so these results that they found demonstrated for poetry, drama, and fiction a tendency to start using older English words. So again, here's a visualization, uh, one of the visualizations they, they have in their, their paper. Uh, and it shows that one way that literary diction differs from nonfiction writing between 1700 all the way to 1900. So the y-axis shows the ratio of old words to new English words, and the x-axis shows years. And so the graph shows age over time of the words. And so the words in poetry, drama, and fiction are at the top and, and the purple, uh, purple line, and the nonfiction prose is the lower line in gray. And so the graph shows a gradual increase in the use of new words, both categories, until about 1775. And then we see a, a divergence with older words beginning to be more prevalent in poetry, drama, and fiction. And so this analysis starts to allow them to point to certain patterns in literary language. So um, next, we're going to talk a little bit about the Hadi Trust and the Hadi Trust Digital Library and how they work to support uh, text analysis, and, and, and again, talking a little bit about the context that we'll be working in today. So this is a diagram that shows how the Hadi Trust Digital Library and the Hadi Trust Research Center um, are in a basic text analysis workflow. So note, and we'll talk about this a bit more, this is not a naturally occurring workflow, but an optional approach that a researcher can initiate. And so we'll talk a little bit more about how text analysis is actually quite nonlinear, unlike this. So in a basic text analysis workflow, um, the researcher gathers digitized text that's been scanned in OCR, um, and OCR is optical character recognition, and then they apply computational methods to the text. So as we saw in those examples, they could do comparative analysis, word counts, all sorts of things to start discerning patterns in the, work, in the, in the text. And then they analyze the results with those uh, algorithms. And where the HTRC, as we call the Hadi Trust Researcher, enters in is it allows researchers to gather text at scale from the Hadi Trust Digital Library, and then it also the HTRC also provides tools and services that we'll work with today that allow to apply computational methods and tools to those those texts from the Hadi Trust Digital Library. And then again, the researcher though at the bottom still has to do their own analysis. So as much as we work with the researchers, as as you as librarians work with the researchers, the researcher then has to do their own analysis. So ever, how many of you have heard of the Hadi Trust? have worked with it, yes, everybody. So <laughs> not going to belabor this point, but just as a very basic overview, Hadi Trust was founded in 2008 and is a community of research libraries committed to the long-term curation and availability of the cultural record. And it's an offshoot of the Google Book Project. And most of the digitization has happened at academic libraries such as yours. And so currently it's over 120 uh, partner institutions who are continuing to contribute uh, digitized material. Uh, so the Hadi Trust Digital Library is concerned with the collecting, preserving, and providing access to this content from the partner institutions. It currently has over uh, 60 million volumes, about half in English, and material going back to the 15th century, uh, though the majority is from the 20th century. And so because of the concentration, more of a concentration in 20th century, about 63% of the material is in copyright or restricted because right status is known, unknown. And then the remaining 37% is what you can search and read on that, uh, through that search interface. Uh, but there's currently a copyright review process uh, that a number of librarians, some of your colleagues, may be involved in to determine right status, and then books are taken or put into public domain as they determine that. Um, and so, and then soon, very soon, the Hadi Trust Digital Library, um, Hadi Trust Research Center is getting set up to provide access to that in copyright text through a process that we'll, I'll talk about in a second, uh, talk non-consumptive research. So Hadi Trust Research Center is allow, is on the other end of Hadi Trust in terms of allowing researchers to gather and analyze and produce new knowledge from the text in the Hadi Trust Digital Library. So uh, researchers can do large-scale computational research uh, through with Hadi Trust text. 
uh, the center is co-located uh, bo both and co-led by Indiana University Bloomington and the University of Illinois, uh, and both institutions do a number of R&D projects uh, and user uh, engagement to enable researchers to do large-scale computational research. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, uh, the Hadi Trust Research Center is getting ready to provide access to in-copyright text, um, but both with the in-copyright text as well as the public domain text uh, that, you, that researchers do large-scale computational research, um, we operate within a non-consumptive research paradigm. Uh, so this is the formal definition right here, but basically it allows the person to run tools or algorithms against the text uh, without actually letting them read that. Uh, and, the uh, and this is because it complies with copyright law because the researcher is engaging with the ideas of the works rather than their specific expressions. And so that's sometimes called non-expressive use because of that um, particular um, type of engagement. And so the non-consumptive research um, protocol, well, not protocol, but paradigm, is the foundational underlying structure of how the HCRC provides large-scale access to the Hathi Trust works. Uh, and so Eleanor actually co-wrote a policy uh, that goes into further detail about our non-consumptive research approach, uh, and that's on the Hathi Trust website as well. Um, so this is, this is um, our outline for the rem uh, remaining part of the day. Um, and so the outline of the workshop is going to in a very basic sense, follow the research process of how a researcher might conduct text analysis. So after this, the next two modules that I'll take you through will be about gathering textual data from both the Hathi Trust and then more generally. Uh, and then we'll talk about working with textual data um, and doing data cleaning. And then, um, and, and then later today, when Eleanor takes over, we'll talk about analyzing t textual data, both again from the Hathi Trust and doing, using Python. And then we'll end the day with visualizing uh, textual data and doing some data visualization. So in each module, we're gonna do hands-on activities um, to think about how you would approach a research question from each of these stages. Uh, and we're in particular gonna use a example research question and a case study at each step of the uh, research process. And again, we'll be using both Hathi Trust Research Center tools and non-HTRC tools as well, so that you're getting a sense of both Hathi Trust, but also more transferable skills as well. Um, and so what our aim is, is to really talk about the, pro give you a sense of the processes, the approaches, and the tools that you can use for engaging text analysis. So you'll le hopefully leave today with a better sense of what is text analysis, what's involved, and how might it be used by researchers on your campus. Um, so we're gonna cover both programming concepts and computational methods, but you're not gonna be an expert coder when you leave here. You'll have some tools in your toolbox. Um, and the, but this will provide you kind of a, a jumping off point that you can then go to other workshops, other tutorials. There's a, a wealth of resources out there um, that'll give you more um, nuances that we won't be able to cover in today's workshop. And so we'll just give you an introduction um, into things that, to think about high-end text analysis research. Um, so we're, throughout the workshop, we're gonna return to this sample reference question for each stage. So imagine that a student comes to you with this potential research topic. I'm a student in history who would like to incorporate digital methods into my research. I study American politics, and in particular, I'd like to s examine how concepts such as liberty change over time. So as we work in each module throughout the day, we're gonna practice different approaches to answering this reference question uh, with these different types of tools. And so this question hopefully will also give you a better sense of how the role of the librarian can play in helping with text analysis research as well. And then we're also gonna look at, throughout the workshop, a real life case study. Um, and this is a real research project that we worked with um, in the Hathi Trust Research Center. Um, and it's called the Creativity Broom, and it was conducted by researcher Sam Franklin, who was at Brown at the time as a uh, doctoral student, he's currently at Stanford, I believe. And he worked with the HTRC to explore the use and meaning of the words creative and creativity throughout the 20th century. So throughout the workshop today, we're gonna to discuss how this researcher approached his question at each stage of the process, and that can give us a more concrete sense of what somebody actually did and considered in, in doing their research project uh, in the text and throughout for this uh, text analysis project. And if you wanna see the full abstract and much uh, more detail about the project, you can follow that link on the wiki, to the wiki, uh, HTRC wiki. 
Um, and so before we move on, we also want to emphasize and just start out the day uh, that our workshop uh, module and our outline may appear to suggest that the research workflow for a text analysis project is linear and follows a very clean uh, predetermined process, like this diagram, that somebody finds text, prepares text, applies the algorithms, and then uh, analyzes and visualizes the results. So while we'll talk about it in that context, the reality is much more like this. <laughs> so an actual text analysis workflow is quite complicated, can be more complicated, and is rarely a linear sequ sequential process. It's often more like this diagram. So but depending on what the researcher is trying to do and the type of project, they may search for some text, they may find it, they may clean it, but then they feel, feel, figure out, oh, I need to get more. They may do exploratory visualization, and that says, oh, I need to get more text. And they may get all the way to preparing the text for the final algorithm and still have to go back. Um, so there's a lot of small cycles, a lot of iterative steps. So wh again, while we're using these modules, as we're, we're going to talk about the text analysis research process as a fairly sequential process, things are a lot messier in real life. Uh, and as some of you have experience uh, in those kinds of projects as well. Okay, welcome back everyone. Sounds like we had some great discussions over the break. Okay, so we're gonna get started again, and we're now, the next two modules are gonna be talking about accessing textual data. Uh, and as some of your comments earlier highlighted some of the challenges that we're gonna talk about in a little more depth right now. Um, so in addition to discussing the variety of text data providers, uh, we'll talk about building a corpus from the HathiTrust Digital Library, and then how do we import it into HTRC, and that'll be our hands-on activity. So again, uh, here's what, an outline what we'll be covering in this next module. Um, we'll explore the options for finding data for text analysis, and we'll also consider the concept of a uh, data set for text analysis. And then for our hands-on activity, we're going to build a work set, what we call a text data set as a work set from the Hathi Trust, uh, and we'll talk about Texas data as a corpora, which we'll talk about a little bit more. And then we'll talk about uh, a, the case study and the reference qu question. Uh, and talk about in the case study how Sam built his creativity corpus from Hathi Trust volumes and understand a little bit more about real world strategies uh, for doing data collection. So by the end of this module, where we're gonna end up is you will have created a collection of volumes from the Hathi Trust Digital Library and prepared it for analytics in the HTRC analytics uh, portal. Okay, so first when we think about collecting uh, text as data. Um, this is a great quote that we pulled from uh, an article by Thomas Padilla, who's currently a visiting digital research ser services librarian at UNLV. Uh, and he wrote about three common challenges to getting text. So first, the data of interest has to be found, as we heard some of our comments. Um, that can be a challenge. Second, the data must be gettable. So again, how do we actually get to that text data if it's even possible? And third, if it's not already formed to the perfect wildest dreams um, type of format, ways must be known of getting that data into a state that is really usable for the desired computational methods and tools. So before any text analysis can actually be conducted, researchers need to find that text data that they need, and the process is not always as easy as it may seem. And so today in, in this next module, in the next uh, few minutes, we're gonna explore ways of finding text. So there's plenty of sources, as we've heard, for getting text data for analysis, um, but suitable text for computational analysis is not always easy to get. And so, so these are some of the challenges that you, will, you and researchers will encounter in trying to get text data. So one, copywriting, copyright and licensing restrictions. So may that copyright restrictions may prohibit users from accessing or publishing with that text data um, or storing it on their own computers. Uh, another common issue are texts are often provided in formats that require additional processing uh, before computational analysis can even be conducted. So some documents are just scanned images, as we heard, and they need to be OCR and made machine readable uh, and cleaned before text analysis. Uh, and then another issue is the systems themselves. So the system may be hard for the researchers to navigate to get at that text data. Uh, and they might need higher level programming skills in order to be able to grapple with those database systems and get the um, pull the text out of that system. Uh, and additionally, uh, some issues may be easier to deal with when you have just a small amount of text, if you're just trying to get 10 volumes, but when you think about larger and larger corpora and, and working up to scale, uh, but when researchers try to work at that large scale, the, the issues are magnified. 
So some things may not be apparent until you try to get that larger corpora. Uh, but things are being under, under the works to hopefully make some of these challenges easier. So now we're going to talk about some of the common types of sources where users can start looking for textual data that they want. So one source um, that's quite common, especially um, what researchers see right away, are vendor databases. So the, the databases that we purchase um, and provide to our researchers, um, that those are often a source that people immediately point to. But often there are licensing restrictions um, because the, even though the data, the data is provided as of higher quality, um, agreements but with the vendors prohibit us from getting that data to actually use for text analysis rather than just uh, reading. So there's, there's often prohibitions on storing and publishing that data. So there's a few strategies that we suggest that can make that um, working with the vendors easier. Uh, first, the library can negotiate addendums to their licensing contracts that get, allows researchers to get access to the text data and permit text analysis. Um, some vendors are providing services for text analysis. So they're building tools and services for text mining their collections. Um, Gale is, is building a tool, JSTOR for data for research, uh, LexisNexis. Um, so some, some vendors do have these services out there, um, but they can be expensive and, and sometimes hard to work with. And then in some cases, researchers can ask for special permissions to mine a specific portion of the vendor provided data, but sometimes that requires fees as well for getting that special permission and getting the access to store and publish the data. Um, and so one example is JSTOR Data for Research, uh, and that one is open and available um, and provides uh, limited types of corpora uh, from the JSTOR um, collection. So one is vendor, uh, and then digital collections. So we've heard some of the biggest digital collections, the Biodiversity Heritage Library, digitized uh, newspapers from Chronicling America, um, so those collections and many, many more that we have in our libraries have a wealth of text data, as we've heard. But these data from libraries is often siloed and not formulated for research at scale. Um, and so when finding data from digital collections, there are two key things that we um, suggest that you look for that can make things easier. First, make sure that it's an accessible format, often plain text. Um, second, look for digital collection uh, content that can be, allow for bulk download as well. Um, and the University of North Carolina's Doc South data we, is an example of a digital collection that's really great to be used for text analysis because they've made it in plain text and they've made it accessible for bulk download. Uh, and there's many others out there as well. And then social media. So social media platforms are an additional source for text data and research based on uh, analysis of social media data is getting increasingly popular and useful. Um, so some social media platforms do have systems that allow access to some of the data. Uh, Twitter in particular has an API and there's some third party tools available as well that allow researchers to plug in and get data. So we at Illinois we had a Crimson Hexagon as one of those tools. So there's many out there that, that might be accessible. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about Twitter APIs later, but this is um, some, the, the ability to get at social media data is constantly evolving as well. Um, so let's talk uh, a bit, you know, th with those um, qualifications in mind, um, what we'd like you to consider, you know, what would be the challenges and weaknesses of trying to use those different sources if the student wanted to build a corpus for political history? So what would be the strengths and weaknesses for each of these sources of data for that particular research question? These are some of the qu things that you want to talk about with the researcher as they're trying to figure out what text data they want to use. Um, so do, do they have a data source in mind? Is it digitized? Uh, what's the period, place, or person of interest? So where, where's the framing? Um, and then how much flexibility is needed for working with that data? Um, are there copywriting and lock licensing restrictions? Um, how experienced is the researcher? So they may need programming skills to get at some of that data. Um, does the researcher have funding? So as, as was mentioned, ProQuest or Wiley may charge for to access that data. And then what format does the researcher expect it to be in? So somebody raised the issue of media. So depending on what kind of media formats they want to use, do they want to just use text or they, is it going to have to be converted in any format? Yeah, so these are just some of the questions that you might think about um, as you're talking with the researcher about what type of data they need, when they need it, et cetera. Um, so when you build uh, a corpora, um, the 
um, there's several things to the process that you'd use to build that corpora. Uh, and so as I've, as we mentioned, uh, corpora are bodies of text, and that's just the term that we use to talk about the unstructured bodies of text that you gather together. So the researcher starts building their corpora uh, first by identifying text, and this, that's often done through a full text search. So finding the key term like creativity or key phrase that's gonna start identifying the types of text that you'd be interested in. And then, Per the, depending on the specific research question that somebody is using, uh, exploring, one can identify text uh, with metadata. So looking for certain authors, looking for a certain date range, um, or even a specific genre. Uh, and that gets into thinking about how accurate is the metadata and identifying these texts. And then often it's a combination of these two things in terms of identifying the text may first through full text searching and then looking through the metadata to pick up things that may have not had immediate identifiers through full text search. So once the texts have been identified, the next step is often deduplication, which means getting rid of multiples of volumes. Um, and so what to keep and what to discard is really dependent on the researcher, as we'll see in some examples. Um, so some ways that a researcher might do some deduplication de de might be based on the OCR quality. So OCR quality can vary highly from fairly uh, dirty, as we'll talk about, to highly, highly curated. Um, choosing the earliest edition, editions without forewords and afterwords. Um, again, there's, and we'll see in Sam's project a little later, kind of all the different ways that you can choose to deduplicate. And so now we're gonna look, we're gonna, uh, this module, we're gonna focus a bit more on how the HTRC can allow you to build text data sets through the, from the Hottie Trust Digital Library Collections and how you can think about assisting users uh, and building up that text uh, corpora for analysis. Um, so the HTRC work, work sets are one way that the Hottie Trust allows users to create text corpora to analyze. So what we call a work set is basically a user created collection of text from the Hottie Trust Digital Library. And so you can think of them as textual data sets. And so the idea behind the work set is that researchers can build their own collections, which is something they're used to doing in the analog world through other means, uh, through a long practices in the humanities. And then these work sets can be cited and used by other users, which helps ensure reproducibility. When we think about research reproducibility, and they, people can test your results using that same analysis with that same collection. And work sets are often also suited for non-consumptive access, which means that users don't directly consume the text themselves, but they run tools or algorithms against that collection of texts for research analysis. So when you view a work set in HTRC analytics, you aren't seeing the text, but you're seeing metadata about the volumes that you've gathered uh, in that work set. And so you can't read the text in that interface on the, on the left. And then at the right, you see the, what the work set is at its core is a manifest. So this is a manifest of the Hottie Trust Digital Library uh, IDs for each of those volumes. So how are we gonna build work sets? So work sets are stored in the HTRC analytics um, system, and you'll need to create an account, which all of you should have done, uh, to tied to your institutional email address. So you have to have uh, use your institutional address and, and not uh, Gmail or Yahoo uh, to store your work sets. And so there's two ways to build your work set. So you can create uh, collections with the Hottie Trust Collection Builder, uh, which we'll be using, and import from the Collection Builder into the Analytics Portal. Um, or another way is to compile your, the volume IDs from that manifest, compile them as, elsewhere, and then upload it to Analytics, and it pulls uh, the work set based on that upload of um, volume IDs. We're gonna do the first method of importing from the Collection Builder. So this, again, here's our sample reference question. And what we want to do is create a textual data set of volumes um, called that the student might use for their uh, research question and then import it into HTRC analytics uh, to do some analysis. Now, so what I'm going to do is I'll first demo this, this hands-on activity and then we'll allow you some time to kind of just go dive in and do it um, based on the handout. So on page five and six are the directions for this next activity we'll be doing. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna log into the digital library, create a collection of volumes, and we're gonna take a collection from the public papers of the presidents of the United States. Um, because let's say the student found, heard about that collection and they're like, I think these volumes might be useful for what I'd like to analyze. Um, so how do we gather a, a, a collection for them of the public papers of the presidents of the United States. 
Um, so I'm going to demo that now, and then we'll have time to then go in. So we'll switch to the digital library. And so what we'll do, we'll go to the digital library, and I'll log in. And if you're a Hadi Trust member, you should see your, you should be able to find your <coughs> institution. If not, you would log in as a guest. So I'll log in. Okay, so we're gonna go to advanced full text search and we're gonna use this exact phrase, public papers in the title and then this exact phrase, United States. and then search. Okay, so we have, so when we build the work set, the first thing we do is we identify the volumes we want. So we click check, check box, you can do individual ones or you can go up to the top and just do select, let's say I want 100 per page, and then I can select all on that page. And then I'm gonna create a new collection. So I, you can see I have several collections, but I'll create a new one. And I'll call this the collection. And then you can add a description if you want. And then you can make it private or public. Uh, public if you have a very highly curated work set, but we'll leave it as private so that only I can use it. And then I have a collection created. And then I go to my collections, and I'm, I'm demoing this, and then we'll take some time to go through it. So go to my collections. You find the collection that you just created. So I'll scroll down. Here it is. And then you'll download the TSV of that, of the metadata as a TSV format. So you download it, save it in a place where you can find it. So mine's in my downloads folder. And then you upload it into analytics. I, I know everything is on the page, yeah. but are you going off like that? Oh, I'm, gonna, I'm showing it, and then you, we'll have some time for you to do it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm just gonna just showing to see how you do it. Uh, and so once you do the works, once you get into, once you download it, you'll go into the work sets and then you'll create a work set. Um, so let's first, and so then, well, and then I upload it through here. So I will, I'm just showing kind of like the basic steps. And then create. Okay, so let's, and then I create the work set and I have a work set. Okay, so that would just kind of show you how to do the process. So now we're gonna take a few minutes and if everybody wants to take, go through the steps and we'll circulate and help you build your work set. Now we have the uh, screenshots actually for this as well, uh, both as a backup and also when, uh, when you take these materials and try to use them, um, so these are available for doing that. Uh, but just to review the steps again for building the work set, we went into the digital library interface, uh, the, the core search, um, we logged in. So everybody should have logged in with their institutional address or their um, Google, Google guest. Um, then we'll search for volumes. And so we use the advanced full text search to search for United States and public papers. So that really narrowed our work set because as you may have searched in the Hottie Trust Digital Library, you can get thousands of results very fast. And then we filtered the volumes um, to see, and one thing that was brought up in the, in the exercise that was good to note, you need to select volumes that are full text view. So that's the only way that the algorithm currently will read the work set is if you have full text view volumes. So that's something to keep in mind as you're filtering as well. And then we added them to the collection by creating a new collection. Uh, one thing to note about when you create your collection name, it has to have the characters only A through A through Z, zero through nine, so you can't add uh, 
um, different characters. So keep that in mind as well. So if somebody is creating a collection and they have um, two, they run into problems, that's why. And then uh, go to my collections to view it. And then we clicked in to view the collection. And then you want to download the TSV file. And then we went into analytics and logged into that. And then we clicked on the work sets in front of the menu. And then you should have chosen create a work set. And then you wanted to up, you should have uploaded the TSV file so that it could read your, your um, work set. And again, keeping in mind that your work set has to have A through Z, zero through nine, and only select characters. And then you have the created work set. So let's, um, in our closing minutes, uh, let's take a look at what Sam did. Um, so he searched across the full text of the HathiTrust Digital Library for creative, the, the root of it. Uh, and he wanted results that either contained creative or creativity. So that's how he searched. Uh, and then after the search, he had an initial list of over two of 2.7 million volumes, but there were some duplicate materials. So he decided the duplicates he wanted to um, get rid of was have the si different editions of the same work, but discard multiple copies of the same edition. Um, so in that case, as Eleanor was mentioning, three libraries may have, cop have digitized the same edition, and it will add all three if you don't identify those same copies. Uh, and so, again, different rules for different projects. So Sam decided he wanted different editions, but not the same edition. Somebody else may want to um, have a different criteria for their project. And uh, the deduplication was not done by hand with over a million volumes, but he used the metadata to filter through and filter out those volumes he didn't want. And now we're going to go straight into the other version, other ways um, of gathering text data. Uh, for doing bulk retrieval. So as, as the, some of the final questions um, asked, what happens when you want more than 1,000 volumes? What happens when you need to do larger scale uh, text retrieval? Uh, so now we're going to talk about some strategies for um, d doing web, grab, gathering text from the web in bulk, using APIs, uh, and doing file transfers to gather uh, text data. Um, so this, here's an outline of what we'll cover in the next 45 minutes. Uh, we'll take a look at how researchers can access data in an automated way that allows them to download text in bulk. So we're going to explore basic API protocols. So if you've heard API and you're a little scared of it, don't worry, we're going to break that down for you. Uh, and then we're going to do some hands-on with the command line and use wget, which is a fairly um, basic script uh, program to do web scraping. Uh, and then we'll, at the end, we'll, we'll conclude by seeing how Sam gathered his data for his creativity corpus. So where we're going to end up is we're going to run commands from the command line interface, and we're going to scrape text from a web page. OK, so for text analysis projects, um, more, more re most researchers will need more than 10 texts. Uh, they're going to be working with hundreds, thousands, or even millions of texts. And getting all this data can be very time intensive. And so as, was, as people have pointed out already, just pointing and clicking is pretty inefficient. Uh, so it's really necessary to automate data, data gathering when possible. So we're going to talk about in the next few minutes what are some options for uh, doing automated data retrieval. And we're going to then practice some basic web scraping. Uh, so one, there's a few, t uh, three different ways in particular that we wanted to highlight for how you automate the retrieval of text. And this is, again, especially important when you're thinking about large scale text analysis. So first, pr providers can make uh, their files available through file transfer mechanisms. So file transfer protocol or FTP or SFFTP, if it's secure file transfer protocol, are ways for moving um, especially large files from one place to another uh, on the internet. And then another way of transferring files is rsync, which is what the Hathi Trust uses. And this is efficient because it only sends the differences between files from the source location to the destination. So you run um, rsync from the command line, and this is what is used to um, extra download extracted features data, which we'll uh, work with a bit little later on today. Uh, another way to do bulk retrieval of text uh, data content is through web scraping, uh, which means, as some of you may have heard about, gathering text, grabbing text from the web. So there's lots of text out there on the web that could be used for text analysis, and web uh, scraping helps you avoid just copying and pasting every single web page. So there's a couple ways to 
uh, scrape text from the web. You can run commands on the command line, which we're going to talk about a little later. And then you can write a script. And a script is basically a file that contains commands, uh, programming statements that the computer will then follow um, to then carry out those actions and scrape uh, the web from the website. And so we're going to be using scripts a little later on today uh, in some of our hands-on activities, but it, just to introduce that concept. And then there's some web scraping software. So if you don't want to write scripts, there's things such as uh, Beautiful, um, Beautiful Soup, Web Scraper IO, or Kimono that do the work um, for you. So we're going to come back to that. But a few things before, we're going to come back to web scraping a little later, but we wanted to highlight a few things that are good, just good citizen practices when you decide to do web scraping. Because web scraping can put a large uh, workload on a server, and this can upset the data holder. If they're like, why is somebody trying to take down my website? And you may be doing that <laughs> unintentionally. So you know, a lot of data providers are more than willing to share, um, but it's good to just ask them. You know, notify them, that, ask them for access, and check for an API, which is a, a less intensive on their website, and, and that's a way that they provide uh, text data um, to you. Um, and if you still have to use web scraping, if there is an API, um, we suggest that you time your requests, and so there's a delay between the hits on the server. Uh, so this is not only polite, but it also signifies that you're a good citizen and that you're doing this not maliciously. Um, so just kind of timing those requests and make sure that you're not taking down the site. Now, APIs. We're going to talk a couple, uh, few minutes about APIs. So this is another way to automate the retrieval of text. So API stands for Application Programming Interfaces. And so APIs are basically instructions written in code for accessing uh, systems or collections, and they provide digital pathways to and from content. And so basically, uh, for example, when you use the uh, Amazon's API, you can display information about the items or for sale on Amazon or gather or items, um, data about uh, sites and uh, items not available for Amazon just by using their API and grabbing that data. So you might think of an API like a mailbox and a key. So you, you open the door with the key, and then that allows you to retrieve or deposit items via that API. So usually you have to write code to retrieve content via APIs, but some of them do have graphical user interfaces, what we call GUIs, that make that process a little uh, easier and more consistent and convenient. So again, a number of digital providers have APIs. Um, so Amazon, as I mentioned, YouTube, a number of places, a number of um, sites make those APIs available. Twitter, which we just we mentioned earlier. Um, so you can grab data, you can grab a certain amount of metadata, um, and some of them are limited. So Twitter uh, can limit the number of tweets um, that you can then display on a, a non-Twitter website. Um, but then there's also things like the Chronicling America API. So our, our hosts do have an a API that allow people to uh, gather the digitized newspaper data. Um, so there's a variety of examples out there of ways that we can gather uh, a, a data from both uh, digital collections as well as uh, commercial providers as well. Um, so a Hottie Trust does have a bibliographic API. Uh, and so access to some APIs is available through a publicly available URL, which is what uh, Hottie Trust does for its bibliographic API. And so that's the kind we're going to experiment with today. So this API is primarily for uh, retrieving uh, bibliographic metadata and volume data. And so there's other APIs for gathering other types of data, but this is one of the more straightforward ones um, and to, to practice with. And so we, we, we use this bibliographic API. We're going to uh, gather the metadata using a specially formatted URL plus the volume ID number. And so we're going to talk about, we're going to do in this next activity, um, a short activity to gather a bibliographic um, data through the Bib API. Uh, so we're going to use, so the hands-on activity we're going to do, and then the instructions are on page seven, is we're in the, in this, and I really recommend you look at the instructions because it really lays out how to do this. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to search the Hottie Trust for a volume, and then you're going to click on the fuller or, or limited search volume, um, and then you want to find the volume ID. So what we're going to do, I'll demonstrate it. And then you're going to use the AR URL in the format. You should see a, a little diagram, a little worksheet that has the different spaces. And so you're going to use that formatted URL. And you should see this on your handout. You're going to use this formatted URL to retrieve the bibliographic data using the Hottie Trust bib ID. So let me demonstrate that, and we'll walk through it together. And then. 
uh, we'll give a couple minutes for you to try on your own. Okay, so what you want to do, so let's say that we have uh, public page. So I'm, let's say I wanted to retrie retrieve the bibliographic data for one of these volumes. So I click into the full view. So I found this book. And when you, when you find the book, everything from the, if you go to the URL, everything from, it says ID equals, and then you see a code. And the first few letters are the code for that digitizing institution. And if you highlight everything from that code to the semicolon, that's the volume ID you want for the Hottie Trust Digital Library. So then I'll go back. So then if I go back, and so each of you should see this um, worksheet here, and you can write it. So I just want to copy this format. So what you're going to type in, or you can copy this from, from the um, materials you downloaded, you have catalog.hightrust.org, API slash volumes. The next step is brief versus full, so that'll just say how long the record is. And then we're gonna put here the ID type that I found in that URL. And then .json. So I copy that from here and open a new tab. So I'll delete that. And so here's the first part, volumes, and then I, let's say I want a full and then the ID type would be HTID. And as you can see, uh, there's several types of ID. We're just gonna use the HTID, but you could also use the OCLC, the record number, the Library of Congress number, um, catalog number. Um, so there's several types of volume ID that you could use. So if I copy the URL and I say full, and then I use HTID, and then I go back to the book where I found it, and I'll copy this ID number right here, and then I paste that in, and then dot JSON, and I hit enter, and then that is the API, that is the API for the bibliographic data. Does that make sense? So let's take a couple minutes, we'll circulate if you want to try it. And again, you might, you might use that worksheet to kind of fill in if you want to write down each piece and then paste it all in. So we're going to move on to, again, this was an introduction, um, and there's much more out there, both on the Hottie Trust API uh, that you're welcome to uh, read and delve into or ask, send questions. But we're going to start um, and dive into the command line and do some web scraping now. Uh, and so this is a bash shell in terminal on the Mac. Uh, and so we're gonna go we're gonna talk about this a bit more um, but this is kind of what it looks like if you're on your computer so what is the command line so command line is a text-based interface that takes in commands and passes them to the computer's operating system to run and accomplish a wide range of tasks uh, so the interface is usually implemented implemented what we call a shell so on a mac that shell is called terminal and that is a bash shell on Windows, it's command prompt. It's not the same thing. They do not speak the same language. So when we talk about a bash shell, we're talking about a Unix-based shell. So a Mac is default, is a default Unix system. And so when you open terminal, you already have a bash shell. For Windows, you'll want to install git bash or sigwin. Uh, Windows 10 does come installed with a bash shell. Uh, but anything earlier than that, you're going to have to install another program. And so avoiding, so in order to avoid all these system issues, because we see a variety of computers out of here, um, we're using Python anywhere. Um, so both to avoid the operating system issues now, and then also for teaching in the future, um, Python anywhere works well uh, when you're trying to teach workshops, um, at least in our experience. So Python anywhere is a browser-based programming environment. Um, so you can write code, you can, save, you can save the files, and also run it from, and then it all runs in your browser. So it comes with a bash, built-in bash console that we're going to be using to run the commands, and it doesn't interact with your local file system. So as we're going to see in a, a, a few minutes, and as you saw in the setup, we have to upload the files 
in order to be able to run them and interact with them via Python Anywhere's Bash shell. Uh, so first, just a couple of basic tips for working in the shell. So first of all, a directory, what it calls a directory, is essentially a folder. So what you see on your uh, finder as a folder is actually the directory. So when you change, so when you change directories, it's like going from the desktop and double-clicking on downloads. Cases, spaces, and punctuation matter. So if you get errors, a lot of times it's because you've forgotten a punctuation, you've added a space that shouldn't be there. So that's immediately the first thing I always look at if something's not working. Uh, and then hitting tab on a, when you're in the command line will autocomplete. So if you start typing the name of a file and then you hit tab, it'll say, oh yeah, that file's in the directory, I'll just autocomplete it. Uh, so that's um, pretty, pretty uh, handy. And also when you have long file names, as you're gonna see, there's some files we'll be using that has super long numbers and you can just um, start and just tab through. Uh, and then hitting in the up arrow will cycle through the last commands you entered. So again, if you get an error message, instead of having to type in the entire script all over again, just hit the up arrow and then you can go back and, and correct that, that command. And then when you view files in a shell, uh, you'll have to quit before viewing command. Uh, and so you use quit, Q to quit viewing the file. Um, so we have a, a video created by our graduate assistant, Roja, that provides a nice introduction to the command line. And this is also linked from our project website as well. Where there's no volume. Hmm. Okay, well, you may. Oh, we forgot to set up the speakers. So, in the interest of time, we'll, we have the backup slides that kind of go through <laughs> the uh, steps that she takes us, takes us through. Um, so the Roja's um, video takes you through the ba basic steps, but we have it here. Um, so if you look on your handout on page eight, you'll see the commands that she takes us through at the bottom of the page. Um, so PWD allows you to see your current directory, and then MKDIR allows you to create a new directory or create a new folder. CD is to change the directory, so to go up and down into different folders. LS allows you to list the files in your directory. And then MV allows you to rename the file. Uh, let, if you type in less, then it'll allow you to view the file. And then, uh, let's see. And then the other two touch allows you to create a new file. So these are some of the um, immediate these are, this gives you kind of a cheat sheet, but let's, in that case, let's just go to Python Anywhere and start. Um, and we'll do some of the, go through some of these basics. So if everybody wants to go into Python Anywhere, and we'll walk through this. And then everybody should be logged in for the free account. Okay, so the console is where you start your bash file. So let's click on consoles. And you may see this, it says you have no console. So we wanna click on bash to start a new console in bash. So has everybody opened a bash shell? So if you type in P, so the, in following the, the steps on page eight, we type in PWD, that tells us where we're at. So that's, if you start getting lost and you're not sure where you are at, PWD, so this shows that I'm in my home directory. And then if you type LS, you see all the files. So you may not see anything at the moment. Well, you should see the activity files dot zip does everybody see that yeah okay yes so you still read me okay 
So the first thing we're going to do is that activity underscore files dot zip. We're going to unzip that. Uh, I don't have it here. So what if you haven't already, when you go to files, you should see a list of files and you should see the activity files dot zip uploaded here. So I'm going to upload it. So once you, once you make sure that you have the activity files.zip, we'll go back to the console. And then just type in unzip activity files.zip. And then the next step, if you see step three, is MV activity files so you'll want to move your in order to do the activities we're going to be doing you want to move them so i'll do mv activity files and then space home he green So was everybody able to complete this, unzip the files and move them? Great. And as I showed, punctuation matters, so make sure the punctuations. And then if you do ls, you should see these files. Does everybody see these files? So after you've done the previous steps, when you type ls, you should now see those files in your directory. Are we good? Okay, so web scraping. So we're gonna use the command line to tool wget, and this helps you transfer files from the web server by doing, which is otherwise known as web scraping. So it also can follow links on the page and follow content too. So how you, depending on how you write the wget script, it can follow just one level of links or it can go three levels down and, and scrape all the pages underneath those links as well. Um, so you, you, special, you, do, you specify that kind of option and other options through the flagged letters that you put in the wget. Um, and so options for a wget include dash L, that tells how far in the hierarchy of links you want to go. Um, and then limit rate sets that transfer speed. So as I mentioned earlier, um, being a good citizen and not hitting that web server constantly, the limit rate dictates how fast you hit the web server. And so the script, the script that we use, we're going to use today, will have all those options, and we'll see in a, in a second how that works. So we're going to return to our sample reference question. And so the students wanting to analyze um, how concepts such as liberty change over time. And so one possible approach that the student might use to gathering data, in addition to the Hadi Trust, is maybe to scrape some political speeches from an open source. So we're going to use Wikisource uh, to start building their corpus um, and scrape some text from there. So in this activity we're going to do now, you're going to run a wget command to scrape text from the open uh, wiki source uh, version of George Washington's fourth State of the Union address. So we have the, the website source here. If you have the uh, slides or the handout open, this is where you can, uh, you can copy the website address. We highly recommend that you copy it. But let's take a look at it. So here's the wiki source page that we're gonna scrape. So you can see there's lots of text, there's lots of different links, et cetera. So what you're gonna need, you're gonna have your Python anywhere open again. We're gonna use the bash shell that we were just working in. The website URL, again, I recommend you copy it uh, from, the, uh, from the handout or from the command itself. And then we're gonna use this wget command. And again, this is something you can copy from the, the handout or slides. Uh, so let's look at that, w, that, that command. So here's the source. And so we're gonna use this command and I recommend that you copy this or you can carefully type it. So here's the command. So we have wget and then dash L space one. And so that means that it's only gonna go one level. It's not gonna follow the links too far down and then dash dash limit rate 
means that we're doing a speed of 20K and 20K is about a thoughtful, it's pretty thoughtful speed. We're not hitting the server too much. And then we give the URL for what we're scraping. So as, as Amanda and Eleanor just said, actually it's better to find, follow the link or Google the fourth state of the union and copy the web address from there. And then output, uh, dash, so dash dash output document Washington underscore four dot txt. That means we we want it to write what it grabs from the website. We want it to put in a new file called Washington four. So otherwise, the command's going to name it something that's going to be the, based on that URL. So we're just going to keep things concise and tell them tell the command put it in this Washington four document. Okay, so if we go to the bash command. So we're going to wget dash l, oh, dash l, one <coughs> dash dash limit rate equals 20k. And then I'll go to the website, copy the URL, paste it in, and then dash dash output hyphen document equals Washington. And actually, I think I already have a Washington four, so I'm just going to do Washington speech. Ah. And then I hit enter. Okay, so let me actually copy the URL that works. Okay, so everybody, when you scrape the text, you should see this kind of screen. It, it connects to the server. So once you have the, the text, it's saved to your files. So there's two ways that you can view that file. You can either go back into your files and you have this super zoomed in. Go back into your files, find the Washington underscore four, and see if you see that, that means it's scraped. So there it is. And this is what's been scraped from the web page. And you can see there's a lot in there that we may or may not want. And then I'll turn it the other way <coughs> is to go back into our bash console. Uh, the file, there's, there's a menu up here. So, oh. yeah, so the Python Anywhere menu up here lets you move back and forth. And let me, right. So I hit Control L to clear my screen again. And then if I do less, Washington, hmm, I don't know what I say. I do less Washington Forest TXT. I can view the file in the bash console itself. And then I hit quit to get out of the viewing. So I hit Q and it takes me back to the bash console. So you're looking, what you're looking at yeah. is the, all the tags plus the HTML code. Yeah, with the HTML tags as well as the text itself. So it's a PDB or a right. web browser? Right. Right. But this time we scraped it onto our own computer for ourselves. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, it does make sense to do it in one file because you only need it in two pages. Right. Yeah. 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 This, is, this is something that you would, especially if you're doing a multiple files at once. So let's talk about. So what, what happened? So as, we, as, as somebody just asked, we executed the wget command and it scraped from that web page using the, e, the URL that we pointed it to and it grabbed everything on that page. So not just the text that we were reading, but under th everything underlying it underneath because it, we told it to go to the server and just grab it. So what do you think is gonna be, need to be removed from this, 
file to prepare it for data analysis because that's the next step is preparing this for analysis. There's a lot of excess headers and footers uh, that we might want to get rid of before we actually make it. Yes, everything. That's a good, good point for what we're going to do next. <laughs> Great. That's the key. Any other thoughts? So we're almost at lunch. So just to wrap up, um, so we did this. So there's other options uh, that you could use. So this was a very, wget's a fairly basic uh, command that we can run, but there's uh, many other options. So beautiful soup. Um, it's a Python-based web scraping tool. It's very powerful. Uh, a lot of researchers use it. Um, I've had researchers come up to me and say, I want to use beautiful soup. And then I'm like teaching myself beautiful soup right now. <laughs> so there's, that's one option. Uh, also, you can write web scraping commands into a script. Um, so a script is a list of directions for your computer to follow. And so we're going to, after lunch, we're going to use some Python scripts uh, to do some, some text analysis. Um, but a, a script lets you iterate through more content and do it in bulk. So we just ran this for one specific URL, but if you have 100 web pages that you need to scrape, you, you don't want to write wget for every single one of those. So a script will let you do that in bulk. And then again, make sure when you do web scraping to time your requests so that you aren't hitting somebody's web server uh, heavily. And, and to, so you're being polite. Um, so. Creating work sets is just one way of working with text data in the Hadi Trust, which we talked about uh, earlier this morning. So you can also download uh, data from the Hadi Trust and HTRC to work on your own machines. And this chart gives you an overview of all the different ways that you can uh, work with Hadi Trust data. So you can do a custom data request uh, and send, um, get bulk access to the page images and OCR of the um, text that are in public domain. Uh, and when the researcher can use ex abstracted text, which we'll talk about after lunch as well, you can use the extracted features, which are per volume files of select meta metadata and data contents, and you get JSON files of the selected data, such as word counts and metadata about those volumes. And then very advanced researchers can use the public domain uh, access public domain HTRC data through the data API, which is used through a special environment that we call the data capsule. So the data capsule is for advanced researchers and it's not great for a workshop environment, it's more for individual projects. So we won't be mentioning it in this workshop or going through it, but we want to mention that as an advanced. Um, and so both the custom data requests and the extractive features are retrieved through those file transfer methods. Uh, so there's no user interface. So you use FTP, ST, um, to our sync to uh, retrieve those. Okay, so to wrap up, let's look at what Sa Sam did. Um, so after creating a final list of volumes from the digital library, he used our sync to retrieve an extracted features data set from the HTRC. Uh, and again, our sync is a command line utility that transfer the files between his computers and the others. Um, and so really quickly, um, just, be, just to say, what is this extracted features data set that we've been mentioning? So again, it's JSON files for each volume from the Hadi Trust that researchers can download. And it has both metadata, bibliographic metadata, as well as inferred metadata, such as page, page numbering, page counts, uh, word counts, uh, and more that we'll talk about in a bit more detail later. Uh, so this is something that we, we encourage, we don't quite have the, the time now to go through it, um, but as some of you have mentioned, how do we think about our digital collections as text data? Uh, so the Santa Barbara statement of collections as data came out of the Collections as Data National Forum, which was an IMLS funded forum last year. So at that link, you can read their statement and it provides a set of high level principles to guide collections as data work. And they just received another phase of that from the Mellon Foundation uh, to, to do some more work in this area. Um, so this is just something that we, we encourage you to reflect on as we think about making our own digital collections uh, ready and available for researchers as text data. Uh, and so these are just some of the highlighted uh, principles that you might consider. Um, and as principle two of the statement says, with collections as data development aims to encourage computational use of digitized and born digital collections. So when we think about what are the textual documents, what are the types of works in our digital collections, you know, what can we do to encourage computational use? 
our hosts right here. The Library of Congress is doing immense work with uh, the LC Lab. So I encourage all of you to really look at all the resources that they've made available for accessing the collections and actually some great IPython uh, notebooks even for how to work with the data. It's really great. So through the afternoon, we're going to be talking about working with text data, then we'll finally get to the analyzing text data piece. So this is your text analysis workshop, right? And then at the very end, um, we'll sort of expand or contract based on time a, a module on visualizing text data. And if we don't quite hit that last module, we've recorded it, and you could always watch it later if you're interested. But I'm hopeful today about our timing. All right, so in this module, we're in module three of the curriculum we're using, uh, we're going to be thinking about what happens when text is data. We'll talk about uh, common steps for cleaning and preparing text data, thinking about how you might make recommendations for researchers about how to get their text data ready for analysis. We'll practice a bit of data cleaning on the speeches that you scraped earlier, and then we'll come back to Sam and see what he did with his creativity corpus to get it ready for analysis. So this is where we'll end up. I know it sort of looks like uh, both look like black text on white boxes, but in one, if you squint, you can maybe see that in the top left corner, there are still the HTML tags. In the bottom right, we've taken them out. So we're going to practice running a Python script to get that data cleaned up. All right, but first let's talk about humanities data. Um, so I work at the University of Illinois. Illinois uh, likes to think about data as material that's generated or collected while conducting research. So that's an expansive definition. I mean, when we're thinking about humanities data, we might be thinking about things like citations, code or algorithms, databases, geospatial coordinates. Can anybody think of any other kinds of data that might be humanities data? Yeah. Text. Text, yeah. You know, it's amazing how many people don't offer that as an answer in this workshop. So yeah, text data, right? That's what we're here for. What else? Yep, go ahead. Well, images, but we don't have the tools to work with them right now. Yeah, images, great. Yeah, recordings, oral histories in particular. Anything else? Transcriptions. Transcriptions, yep. That's all great. So when we start to think about text as data, we often have to shift the way that we are approaching uh, text as we commonly think about it. So you might not think about data quality necessarily when you're reading, say, a novel unless you spill coffee on your library book, right? Uh, but in this case, we want to think about the quality of the data that we're going to use for analysis. So OCR can be both clean or dirty. Are you familiar with those terms? So yeah, this is a basic term. Clean OCR, someone has gone through and done corrections. Dirty OCR has had no corrections done or minimal corrections. So how to trust OCR is dirty, it's uncorrected. And part of that has to do with how large the corpus is. It would take a lot to clean up um, over 16 million volumes. And also the act of cleaning, which I hope that uh, you'll see as we go through this module, is uh, individually driven. Every researcher, every person has an idea of what it would mean to remediate their data. And so we don't want to make any choices to the OCR that would then make it more difficult for somebody to actually get at the information they were hoping to get. Uh, when we think about text as data, we also start to think about the corpus or the corpora. Um, so a text corpus is a digital collection or an individual's um, text data set. And then corpora are bodies of text, so that's just the plural. Um, and another nice way that you can think about text as data is thinking about the way that the text, when you're getting ready to analyze it, might go through a process of decomposition or recomposition. And these are terms that we borrow from Jeffrey Rockwell. Um, so cleaning can involve discarding data, which can be like decomp decomposition. So maybe you're getting rid of elements that were on the page or certain words, and you're getting past what was human readable to something that the computer can do something with. Um, and so oftentimes the prepared text, it might be legible in that you, you know, you could sit and read, say, that JSON file that we looked at earlier with the metadata, uh, but it's not legible in terms of something that you would enjoy sitting down to read on the weekend for fun. So when a researcher goes about the process of preparing data, they'll do things like correct OCR errors. They may remove text um, from the page object, like titles or page headers. Can anyone think why that would be important to remove the page header? Yep. So that becomes the most common yeah. Like it's on every page. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't tell us much to know that Moby Dick 
is those are the two most frequently occurring words in Moby Dick, right? We aren't learning anything more about what the about what Melville was saying. Uh, removing tags, that's the one we're going to practice. You might split or combine files, uh, remove certain words or punctuation marks, lowercase text, or tokenize words. And we're going to look at some of these in more detail in a second. All right, so just to um, really drive home these key concepts, oftentimes when we're thinking about how we're going to prepare text, uh, we can think about it in terms of chunking and then recombining. So first thinking about chunking the text, which is the idea that you would split the text into smaller pieces. Um, and so often it's going beyond the book or the volume as an object and breaking it into smaller pieces that have some um, importance to the research question. So let's say somebody wanted to do a comparative analysis of all of the speeches of Abraham Lincoln and maybe there was one book that was published of all of those speeches and then the researcher is going to go through and break that text file that represents this book object into smaller pieces, one file for every speech. So they're chunking it up so they can do that comparative work. Other times we're thinking about grouping text. Maybe you're going out to a wiki source and you're grabbing all of the um, George Washington speeches that you can find there and you end up with these files that you scrape from the web and you're going to concatenate them together to make one big file that's all George Washington so you could compare that to um, Abraham Lincoln. The important thing here is that you really have to go beyond thinking about the volume, the book, the periodical as a discrete object that ha that is conveys the most important meaning, right? You might want to break it up into pieces, you might want to smash it together with something else. So we're just sort of taking that next step. Another key concept that we want to talk about here is tokenization. So take it, tokenization is the idea that you're going to break text into pieces that are called tokens. Um, and the process of doing this will discard punctuation marks um, and often there's some normalization that happens also where maybe the text becomes lowercase. So here we have the beginning of the Gettysburg Address and you can see that you can read it. It's human readable, but it's not human readable in the sense that this isn't how you would sit down to read the speech. And every one of the words has been broken out into an individual chunk where you know, we're seeing it notate, the notation with the brackets. And then now, because this process has happened, this, doesn't, this isn't a human editing process, this is a computer generated process, tokenize the text. We have these, these chunks that you can start to count up. So this is that, the bit about reducing and abstracting the text. All right, so it's important also to keep in mind that data preparation is gonna affect the results of analysis. So the amount of text, the size of the chunks, will uh, impact what you get out of a text analysis algorithm. Which stop words are removed will also have an impact. Uh, which characters are included or taken out. Uh, whether the text is lower, low, put into lowercase or otherwise normalized. Um, and this process takes time. This is often considered to be one of the most time intensive pieces of doing data analysis is this sort of um, I don't like this term, but sort of data janitorial work, right? Data munging. This takes a lot of effort to get everything ready for you to put it in for your analysis. Um, and this is where running some kind of scripting process becomes useful. So uh, you don't want this to turn into an editing process. And I think for some, there is the temptation to think, I am going to get my text ready. And there is a point at which I have gone through and read, you know, all of my volumes and I've lowercased everything and everything is spelled perfectly. And while that temptation is there, uh, it's up to the researcher to decide how much noise they're willing to accept in their data. And some level of noise is generally accepted to be okay. But it's up to the researcher to figure out what that level is. Yeah. Can you explain what you mean by normalizing? Yeah, so normalizing words, um, think about if you were doing a study of 19th century literature and you had some works that were written by American authors and some by British authors and they use two different spellings for words like color. You have to make the choice, do I want to leave that spelling difference there or do I want to say that every time the text has color you normalize it to either O-R or O-U-R. Yeah. Any other questions? That's a great one. Okay, so uh, in your small groups you are going to uh, read definitions for some of these data preparation terms. 
Uh, so there are seven of them. And so divide them amongst yourselves. Uh, you'll each read two or three. And then when you finished reading, you're going to explain what you read to your group mates, to your partners. Um, these definitions are taken from a paper that was written by Denny and Sperling in 2017. Um, and I quite like this paper, actually. Uh, I say this in every workshop that we do, but I think this is a fun read. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, I would recommend going back and reading the paper that they wrote. Um, but we'll give you uh, about five minutes to take the time to read through these and then discuss them in small groups. All right, how's it going? Did you all get through all of them? Okay. Did you have any questions about the terms that you read? Any thoughts about these about the terms that you went through? Yeah. You mean if you Yeah, so you could choose not to lowercase all of your text if you think, oh, this is chock full of names that I think would create disambiguation problems if I did lowercase normalization. Um, but you, you can also do part of speech tagging before you start your analysis. So then we're going to look at a data set example later this afternoon where all of the tokens have been put through part of speech tagging. So that's another way to figure out when you mean a rose is a rose is a rose, yeah. Um, but it, in some of these instances, you would choose not to do the thing that you think would cause an issue for you. Say for the one about the numbers with the um, sections of US code, in that example, those researchers might choose to leave numbers in, whereas other researchers might take them out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw a hand in the back first. So, um, so I had a question on the engram inclusion. So mm -hmm. I get, you know, something like United States, you would want to keep that there. Uh huh. Yes. Is there a list of those the same way there is with like common stock words? Or mm. do you have kind of a priori frame guess if you're dealing with a big data set of what might be in there that way? Because obviously, you're not going to read them. Yeah, I think that's sort of like a subject expertise question. So that's a know your data, know your research question kind of thing, where if you think it would be really important in your data set because of the nature of the materials you're looking at to keep United States together, then the researcher would set that at the outset. But I've never seen an n-gram list like that. Um, yeah. Did, did you have a question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What would be the benefit other than processing the speech? Um, well, so for some algorithms, like the infrequently used terms, um, y what you're trying to study has more to do with the terms that were used frequently. And so you, you just don't really need to have them there in order to do the work. And so taking them out can make sure that you're looking at data that you think is meaningful in some way. Um, so size is one piece, but also this is one step of setting the scope of your research. And when we look at Sam later, we're going to see some of the tokens that he got rid of. And this is sort of a what goes in, what comes, what goes in is what will come out sort of thing. Because you could, especially with things like stop words, you could get really sort of red penny with your stop words and go through and just start taking things out. And suddenly you're going to have topic models that have only certain words displayed. So it's a, it's a balancing act about trying to make sure that the results are, you feel are somehow meaningful and representative, but also that you have not pushed in such a way that you're just getting out what you wanted to get out of it. It's a balancing act. So a related um, concept that I've heard expressed elsewhere is to try to always have a baseline text that stays the same. Yes, yeah. Yes, you yeah. Get your baseline text figured out and then you would remove things or add yes, things yeah. on top of it in a different version. Yes, yeah. The, we, we, you know, we, we don't talk about that, but we should because it comes up regularly. And sometimes we have people who are confused, like, oh, if you get rid of all the words, then you've made you know, these changes that you can't go back. But it's, 
you're right, you want to do this in separate versions. So then if you do run an analysis where you say you take out certain kinds of stop words and it doesn't look quite right, then you just go back to the earlier version and you make some other modifications and you try again. Yeah, so this is, it's not like these are permanent changes. This is sort of building on top and you can always go back and try again. It's definitely an iterative process. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? All right, how many of you have experience with Python programming or with programming generally? Awesome, okay, well this actually is, uh, you guys are an experienced crowd, so, um, which is great. So just as a reminder, yeah. Uh, we don't intend the Python portion of the program to prepare you to go out and write your own code or to be an expert developer, but we just want you to feel more comfortable with it. And if you already feel really comfortable, then this might be a good time for you to lean over and help your neighbor if they need a little bit more help getting through the activities. Okay, so we start with an introduction to Python. So what is Python? Um, so Python is a scripting language, um, and it's also an interpreted language. And if you try to look up on the internet, what is Python, often the definition you find is it is an interpreted language. And I don't know about you, but that means literally nothing to me. Um, but what interpreted means is that it follows step-by-step -step directions. So what we're going to be doing is running a Python script, which is a series of step-by-step -step instructions that your computer is going to follow in order to complete a task. And so the task today is going to be things like, um, we're going to take out the tags, we're going to remove stop words, but the script is just a list of directions that your computer follows. And Python has a relatively straightforward syntax. This is something that the Python community feels good about. They call, you know, we're Pythonic. So I don't know if any of you have used SQL where you're used to having the semicolon at the end of the line. That's not a thing they do in Python. Uh, but what that means is that if you pick up a Python script and you have some idea of what you're looking at and also the person has well documented their code, it's not too hard to get a feel for what's happening. Whether you could write it on your own is another question, but it, it, it's sort of like, ah, I see they have this thing and it's gonna do that thing. I sort of understand what's happening. Um, so that's one of the benefits of talking about Python today. All right, so there are a few different ways that one would interact with Python. Uh, I'm, we're gonna mention two and then I'll throw out a third, but we're gonna use just one of those. So we mentioned this first one because one of you will invariably open up the bash shell, type in Python and hit enter, and then you're gonna see these three carrots and you're gonna go, huh, what am I supposed to do now? Um, that means when you type in Python and then hit enter, you are running what's called the Python interpreter. So you're doing interactive programming, which means that the computer with these three carrots is saying like, okay, give me a Python command to enter. Give me a little bit of Python for me to do. And so you do it line by line or step by step. Remember, this is just step by step directions. Um, so this is one way to get experience with Python is to practice in the interpreter. Uh, but you can see where this would become not useful if you say wanted a nice file that you could reuse over and over again and you don't wanna type out the directions. So this is, we're not doing this today, but if you do type in Python and then you see the carrots, uh, yeah, there are three, sorry, just thought, well, maybe there's actually four, but there's three. Okay, you're gonna type in quit, and then open parens, close parens. That's how you get out of there. All right, but you're not going to, because we did the warning. Okay, so the way that we are going to use Python today is by uh, running scripts that have been written. So scripts, again, are just lists of directions that your computer is gonna follow. You save the file where the script is written in a um, format that has .py at the end. So this is a Python script that you can execute, you can run, and then it will open the file and follow the directions. And then we're gonna be running these from the command line. So on the command line, you'll um, enter in Python and then the name of the file and maybe some additional directions and then you'll run it that way. Um, another way that we could teach this workshop is by using Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and I know, or I think that there are nice Jupyter Notebooks for. Um, some of the LC Labs work that they have been doing. And if you're just starting out with Python and you're like totally blank mind in terms of where to go from here, you might actually wanna start with Jupyter Notebooks because what it does is it takes the script, so each of those step-by-step -step directions, and it's a way of rendering it so that you can have narrative before and after. 
and it's embedding it in a viewer that I think is much more friendly for the beginner to understand what's happening. It's a little, it's like the interactive programming meets the running of the file in this way. So it's a nice combination of the two. All right, so when you wanna run a Python script from the command line, the first thing that you have to type, on, type in is Python. So you have to tell the computer, I'm about to give you directions, they're in a certain language, and this language is Python. And then you give the script name, and then at the end you include arguments. So these arguments are some additional directions that the script needs to run, and in the script itself it will say whether or not it requires arguments, and it will number how many there are, and give some idea for what those are. And we're gonna look in a second about, uh, to see what that looks like in practice. So tell the computer, get ready, I'm gonna give you some Python, directs it to which file to open and run, and then there may be this additional information. All right, so let's return to our sample research question, and we are going to use a Python script to prepare the text data that we scraped from Wikisource. All right, so we're gonna remove the tags, blah, blah, blah. You need the bash console, so you might wanna start pulling up Python anywhere and get your console ready. Uh, we're going to be running it over the Washington underscore four dot txt, and the name of the script we're going to be using is remove tag dot pi. All right, so I am going to move into Python anywhere. Did we talk about Control L? If your if your shell looks really ugly, do Control L, and it will remove. It will sort of like start you afresh, but you can still. Uh, arrow through your previous commands. They didn't disappear, they just are gone from your view. All right, so let's, uh, let's take a look at the file that we're gonna run. So we're doing remove tag.py. So you'll see at the top that we're doing, the, we have these import statements, we'll talk more about that later. Um, and then you'll see that there's a line. So we have this line in green. That's a comment. The green is a comment. The computer doesn't read that. It skips over it, but it's for you, the human, uh, to understand what's happening. And it says, requires an input file name when running the script. So we have eh, done an okay job of documenting the process of what's happening here. And you'll see that there's sys.argv and then one. So this script requires one argument in order to run. And the point of the argument here is that they want the user who's running the command to supply some additional information so that you could pop in different files, different text files, and run the same script over a different text file. Okay, so if you have this open, you're gonna just wanna close it and go back to your bash console. All right, and so we're just gonna do the first step all together. So. What is the first thing that we need to type in? Python. But don't, hit but don't hit return. And then what's the next thing we need to type in? Remove tags. Remove tags, yep. And I'm exceptionally lazy, so I'm using my tab, so I have to type as little as possible. And then what's the last thing I need to type in? The name of the script, yep. And I have several of them. And I didn't get an error, so now I'm going to view the file using less. Oh, sorry. We renamed the file. Look, I didn't read the directions well. So we see here, this is probably too small for you, isn't it? Is that better for viewing? We see here that we're opening a file called taglessfile.txt and we're writing to it. So can you see how this is, I mean it's not like easy, but it's also like, okay, I can understand something is getting open and something is getting written, right? So we're opening a file and we're writing to it. So when I tried to do the less command here, I did it wrong because I was trying to look at Washington, but we didn't actually, as we discussed a few minutes ago, we didn't overwrite anything on Washington 4. We created a new file that doesn't have any tags. So I wanna do, taglessfile.txt. So you should all have this file now, and you should be able to see that the tags have been stripped out. Okay. 
So remember, you can put your stickies up if you get stuck. Um, if you have gone through this, try to do the activity at the bottom of page 13. So can you remove the stop words? All right, so if you are an experienced uh, Python person, you probably don't feel too proud of yourself right now. But if that's the first time you have ever run a Python script, congratulations. It was less scary than you might have thought it was going to be, right? It's just like entering the commands in that we did earlier, except that we're running the, the commands over these files. OK, so and we had someone point out that we think there's something wrong because we didn't remove a tag at the end, right? Which it points out a pitfall of taking somebody else's code and trying it on your own materials. Uh, you want to, you know, there's going to be a process of trying to make it fit for what you want to do or correcting a mistake that they made. Okay, we can skip these. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so you executed a command to get most of the URL, um, or sorry, most of the HTML tags and. Oh, we're in a really weird place in these slides. I'm sorry. It's like, this is not making sense. Let's move ahead. Yeah, this is where we want to be. All right, so it, lo it looked for those carrots to denote the HTML tags, or most of them. And then it used a regular expression, and then uh, Python's replace to get rid of what was in between those tags. So it's simple and also slightly broken. And this is also not the most robust way to remove the tags. So this is just more for playing. But if somebody were working with lots of files, they would want to make modifications so that they could feed in an entire directory of files and not just one at a time. Or if somebody had used something like Harriet mentioned beautiful soup earlier, the joy of beautiful soup is that you can direct your web scraping to only grab what's between certain tags. And then you just skip this whole mess altogether. And we did that. All right, so what did Sam do? So when Sam um, was doing his data preparation, so remember when we last left Sam, he had first generated that very large list, and then he had started to weed down within that list to hone in on the volumes that he really wanted for his analysis. And then he went a step further to, uh, to restrict the materials that he was looking at even more. So the first thing that he did was um, he only kept the pages the, the data that he was looking at retained page level information. So he could see this was page one, this was page two. And he said, I only want the pages that included my search term. So that creative with the asterisk. And he got rid of everything else because he decided he was most interested in studying the discourse around words like creativity or creative. And he didn't care if the word occurred at the very beginning of a text um, and then at the end, never again. He didn't care what was happening at the end of, of the work. He just wanted to know what was happening right around that word. But then proximity and using pages was one way um, to model that proximity. And then he discarded all tokens, such as pronouns and conjunctions, that he didn't think carried meaning. So he was keeping what he considered to be the most meaningful terms. All right, so how many of you have read this piece, Against Cleaning, by Katie Rawson and Trevor Munoz? It's really nice. Uh, we're not going to have you read the whole thing, but I'd recommend that you do if you're interested in exploring uh, more of the um, things that they're talking about in the passage that we're going to look at. Uh, so the project that they're describing, just for a little bit of context, was um, working with data from the What's on the Menus project. Um, and they were talking about curating menus. Are you familiar with this? So it was a big crowdsourcing project from the New York Public Library where they uh, transcribed menus from restaurants in New York. Um, and then dealing with this massive trove of data, they had to decide, uh, is chocolate cake the same thing as chocolate, chocolate tort for the purposes of our data? Is a molten chocolate cake the same thing as a chocolate tort? And so they were thinking through this process of preparing and cleaning their data um, and what, they, what, what these sort of cho choices that they were making, how it would impact uh, research, their own research and others' research on the corpus. All right, so here's the paragraph. It's also on page 14 of your handout. I'll give you just a second to read through it. Okay, so you made it to 151. When we finally talk about analyzing text data, <laughs> you made it. <laughs> you didn't know what you were getting into, did you? All right, so uh, we divide this topic up just like we did the gathering text data piece into um, 
two separate sections. So we're going to talk about off-the-shelf tools first, and then we're going to talk about more advanced uh, do-it-yourself approaches to text analysis. So in this first half that we're talking about off-the-shelf tools, we're going to discuss the benefits and drawbacks of using a pre-built tool for text analysis. Uh, we're going to learn about um, a web-based topic modeling tool from the HTRC, and then we're going to talk about uh, an attempt that Sam had to use an off-the-shelf tool for his analysis and talk about his outcomes there. All right, so where we'll end up, we'll have some word clouds of some topics uh, related to public papers from the 1970s. All right, so there are a handful of pre-built text analysis tools on the market, so to speak. Uh, the benefit of these tools is that, for the most part, they're easy to use. So they give the impression of plug and play. You put data in, your results come out. Um, and because they don't require programming or coding, they're good for teaching and for getting people up and running. But you, uh, once you start working with scholars in this field for a little while, you find that people have a threshold at which they say, like, this doesn't do what I want it to do anymore, just give me the data. Um, that's something that we hear a lot from researchers, just give me the data. Um, so the drawbacks of using these pre-built off-the-shelf tools are that there's less control, and then because of the way that they're built, there are limited capabilities, because you're constricted by the system as it exists. Um, that said, they can be very powerful for getting people just started with text analysis for teaching, uh, for quick examples where you don't really need to do a deep dive. Um, so some examples here are Voyant and Lexos, um, and then also the HTRC algorithms. So we're going to be using the topic modeling algorithm. All right, so then um, in contrast to the off-the-shelf tools, there are these do-it-yourself tools. Um, so these are an alternative uh, to these pre-built tools, and they generally involve some kind of programming. So you're going to have to know how to code, how to install things from the command line usually. Um, you're going to have to have sort of a deeper knowledge of the, the files that you're working with, file types, um, and then also how to install and get these programs going. But the benefits are that you are running them on your own. So it's more flexibility for the researcher. And generally, they allow for more parameterization and control over the research process. But again, they require that technical knowledge that not everyone has. And quite honestly, not everyone is willing to pick up or wants to pick up. And that's OK, too. But we're going to return to these later. Question. Yeah. Yes, they, yeah. They, to the extent the science, what tool they use, not just the sources. Uh-huh. So yes, yeah. So um, you want to encourage people to think critically about the tool that they're using, report which tool that they used, so that others understand how they came to their conclusions. All right, so when you go about the process of picking a pre-built pre -built tool or recommending a pre-built tool, it really depends on the goal of the researcher, which is sort of a flippant thing to say here, like, well, it depends, right? Uh, but it really does. So the tools uh, have different strengths and weaknesses. So if you want to do quick analysis, get a visualization up and running really quickly, Voyant and Lexos are fantastic. Um, they're easy to use. Uh, you can run and you can install and run Voyant locally, but uh, there's a web-based version, and Lexos is also web-based. Uh, if you have a researcher who wants to do concordances, uh, then they probably want to be using a tool called AntConc, which I don't have much experience with, but my colleagues tell me is easy to use. Uh, Voyant also has a nice uh, concordance function. And then if someone is interested in doing machine learning, there is a pre-built tool called Weka, the Weka Workbench, and that's another one that you install, you run it locally, but it has an interface that the researcher walks themselves through in order to carry out the machine learning process, so they don't have to program a tool themselves. I hear typing, so I'm just going to pause. All right, are we good? All right, so the tools that we're off the shelf, off the shelf tools that we're looking at in particular today are um, a, we're going to look at a topic modeling tool that's part of the suite of algorithms provided by the Hathi Trust Research Center. Um, so the HTRC algorithms are plug and play text analysis tools. They're built into that HTRC analytics interface. 
Um, and that means that they're mostly as is. So you can do some parameterization. Um, you have some choices about how to run your job when you do your analysis, uh, but you're limited in what you're allowed to set as a parameter um, and what is uh, built into the tool to ask the user. Um, and they're built specifically to analyze HTRC work sets. So the data that you moved over earlier, that's the kind of things that you can analyze. And there you can't bring in outside data. Because remember, we're just looking at these manifests of volume IDs. So they're good when you want to work with HT text specifically. All right, some are task oriented, others are more analytic. Uh, we're going to be using the topic modeling algorithm, which is more of an analytic, analytic type algorithm that helps a researcher to get a feel for the uh, content uh, of their data set. All right, how many of you are familiar with this idea of a bag of words? All right, so uh, we're going to be talking about topic modeling in this algorithm. And topic modeling is a kind of text analysis um, process that uses a bag of words um, setup paradigm. And when you're working in this bag of words idea approach to text analysis, uh, you stop caring about the word order and how it appeared on the page, and you just care that it was there. So there are some um, algorithmic processes that just want to know what was in the text. Um, so I sometimes imagine this like I pick up the page and I shake it off and the words come down and now I have my bag and I shake up my bag and the order is lost. Um, so that means that you're discarding things like uh, grammar as well. So you're, you're missing some of that information, but for the purposes of these algorithms, the way that they have been conceived of by the folks who built them is that that is okay, that doesn't matter. So here we see the Gettysburg Address again, but we see the words all jumbled up. So this is our bag. We have our bag of words at the bottom. All right, so we are talking about topic modeling. Um, so here we see some of our key terms in the context of topic modeling. So uh, when you go about topic modeling, when you use a topic modeling algorithm, this is what happens. You chunk the text, you hack it up into documents, and the documents are just chunks, they're pieces of text, um, and those documents are bags of words. So the word order doesn't matter within these chunks of documents. Uh, generally, you remove stop words or you remove some words, so the tool we're using today uh, removes stop words. Um, some topic modeling experts are moving towards removing the infrequently used terms instead of the stop words, but um, the one that we're going to use today is the stop words, and that's sort of traditionally how it's been done. Um, and then each word in the document is compared, and it's sort of like the computer picks up a word, and it goes, huh, topic. What other bags, what other documents does this word appear in, and uh, what other words are around it? Check, 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 check. Okay, pick up another word. Okay, you know, here's chunk. Which other bags is it in? Okay, and then it starts to build a model that's a, it's a guess, it's probabilistic to say, I think that if I find the word um, Washington in this text, it is likely to be in the context of these other words. And that is suggesting that there's some kind of meaning in the way that we choose to talk about certain topics. So if I'm talking about chicken noodle soup, you're likely to find words like bowl and spoon and chicken and winter, and you're unlikely to find things like sand, right? So there, you, it just follows some sort of logical progression. So the topic's just a prediction of word co-occurrence, but don't think about it as co-occurrence as like the words appeared side by side. It's co-occurring in the same bag. They're together in the bag, so they are conceptually likely about the same thing. All right, so here are some tips for topic modeling. Uh, treat topic modeling as one step in the analysis. You don't just like throw it in, beep, boop, boop, and then you get something out, and you're like, ah, my text is about whatever these topics say. Uh, again, input, just like we talked about before, it affects your output. So you can start to zhuzh your analysis in certain ways, such that maybe your topics start to look like what you expected by getting rid of lots and lots of words in your stop word list. Um, and say by doing topic modeling over one novel. Okay, well, I can read a novel, right? I can tell you what topics are in it. Um, the, the strength of topic modeling generally has to do with like lots of text, right? So it tends to work better when you're looking at more text. You want to be somewhat familiar with your input data because there is some human interpretation that happens with your results. So you need to be able to say like, oh, no, that's, that's, 
that's not good. What's what made this result not good? Is it my input data? Is it the way I set the parameters? Um, what do I need to do in order to get results that are good? Um, and then you also need to understand the tool that you're using. Depending on the tool, uh, you'll have different outcomes. And so you need to know what's happening. Just like Rick was saying, if you want to go back and defend your work, you need to know actually what happened with the tool that you were using. And if you can't speak to what was happening with the tool, then you have less firm ground to stand on in terms of defending your results. All right, so uh, this is the description of the HTRC's topic modeling algorithm. And the slide is probably a little bit too small for you to see, but that's OK, because you all are going to read it. Um, so in, well, actually, let's see how we're doing in terms of time. Um, no, you're not going to read it, because it's going to take too long. <laughs> OK. All right, so uh, what the, the HTRC topic modeling algorithm does is that it loads each page. So in HathiTrust, every page is a separate file. That's just an artifact of the system. So this uh, algorithm treats every page as a document for the purposes of the topic modeling. It removes the first and the last line, so it's doing some pre-processing. It joins hyphenated words that occur at the end of the line. Um, it removes all tokens that don't consist of alphanumeric characters, and we're going to see how there are some things that squeak through e anyway. It removes stop words based on a filter that is set by the tool. So it's, again, a know your tool sort of thing. Um, and then it uses mallet. How many of you have heard of mallet? Great. So mallet is a pretty commonly used topic modeling tool. It uses mallet on the back end uh, to build out these topics. All right, so we're back with our sample reference question. Uh, and we are going to run this algorithm all together on the same work set so that we all have the same results to view together because we're going to go through the process of um, thinking about the results. <coughs> all right, so bring up the HTRC analytics site. Make sure that you're still logged in. It might have booted you because you've been inactive. Yeah, sign in. That should work. That's how long every password at Indiana University has to be. So I, I don't work at IU, so it's just this one. Um, yeah, I always tell people that because it's like the sympathy makes you feel a little better for having to do it. All right, so then it, once you're on analytics.hadithros.org, you're signed in, you're going to click algorithms. And you're going to see that there are a suite of tools here. Um, you're taking this workshop at a eh, not inopportune time, but sort of a weird moment, because we're in the process of refreshing these. So if you log back in next week, the topic modeling algorithm will be slightly different. It'll be slightly more robust, and the visualization will be cooler. Um, so, But this is just a good time for us to practice what it's like to read the results of a topic modeling algorithm. All right, so we have our description here again about what's happening. And you, let's see, we are on page 16 of the handout. So this is actually not hard to do, and so I'm just going to let you do it. So follow the directions, run the topic modeling algorithm. The key thing here before you get too far is that you want to make sure you're including public work sets. And then you want to make sure that you're getting to the same one that we're all using. So type in EF and then hit the down arrow. Oh, yeah, you won't see all these. These are mine. Until you get, these are private. So um, it'll work for you. Type EF and then hit the down arrow once, and you'll find poly underscore science underscore DDRF at Eleanor Dixon. They're alphabetical after the at by username. So We'll all get the same results if we use the same parameters because of the way the results are being cached. Uh, so check steps five and six to do the parameterization. So I'll mention too right now that um, that your jobs are going to go through like 
lickety split. That's because we're all doing the same thing at the same time. That's a job that was already run, the exact same parameters. So if you're teaching a workshop and you want to make the time go faster, run the job in advance that you expect the students to do. Um, the way that this is working is that the job is being sent to the computers at, uh, at Indiana University, and then you get put in a line with other jobs on their compute cluster. And so if you have a really big job, you might have to wait in line longer, which isn't how we're used to thinking about computers very often right now. We're like, okay, I want results, but sometimes there, it will be sitting in that queuing, and then in the running if it's really big for a while. If it takes a really long time, something's gone wrong, and you should cancel, try again, or contact someone, but you can sometimes have to wait a few minutes to get results back, especially if it's an intensive process. All right, so here are my results here. Looks like most of you had gotten them. So we see the, the word clouds here. We see this XML file. This is part of what I was saying would get more robust. The, re the results files are much nicer in the update. Uh, but you see the way that it's weighted in the word cloud. And then you can also look at the um, the words that appear in each topic. But I'm going to move back to the slides because it's actually a little bigger there and will be easier for us to look at. All right, so these are some of the topics that were generated. I guess these are all the topics that were generated when we ran it. Um, the other thing to know about topic modeling, because it's probabilistic, means that outside of this HTRC context where the, the results are cached, if you ran a topic model and then ran it again and then ran it again, you're going to get different results every time because it's just a, a guess. And so it's, that's something to expect to have happen if you start getting into topic modeling. All right, so, what, so you'll see that they're just numbered, zero through four. So we have five topics. And they're not named, right? The computer is not like, ah, oh, yeah, this is, you know, uh, public parks or whatever. So what would you name these topics? Can you think of any that seem like, okay, I have an idea what this topic is? Well, number three looks like foreign affairs. Okay, yeah, foreign affairs. Anything else? Number one looks like communication. Uh-huh, yep, I definitely see that. Communication. Anything else? Yeah, yeah, I like that one too. Propaganda flux, yeah. Anything else? Well, yeah, like economy or resources mm -hmm. or infrastructure. Yeah. So, you know, I didn't do, which I missed the key piece here, which is what were the texts that we even looked at, right? <laughs> so, know your input data, know your results, right? So, these are. Remember before we were looking at those public papers when we were doing the searching? These are all of the public papers from presidents in the 1970s. So these are t topics from the 1970s, speeches across a couple different presidents. Any other thoughts here? You'll see that we're getting some weird tokens, right? Yeah, we're seeing, we're seeing some artifacts there. Something is, not, something is a little funky with the tokenization. So that's a know your tool sort of thing, right? Yeah. If, if you're thinking about it in the context of the time, it's talking about you know question oil and doing the time. It's it's trying to formulate the the <coughs> before them. Mm -hmm. So it, it looks disconnected, but if you think about it as to what might be going on, you know, with oil, the time of next question, American, good. Mm -hmm. It's it's trying yeah. To Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, topic one looked to me somehow like uh, community building or a consensus building. A lot of words in there are like the things that someone would use. Because now you told us there are speeches. Yeah. So they're the kind of things that a president, my fellow Americans, yes, yeah. um, sort of all working together here to get our government back on track, or you know, that kind of. So it was sort of, that seems to be what the purpose, though, is kind of, kind of bringing the country together. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like looking at these, you get a general idea of what kinds of things they might have been talking about during that time period? So why I someone might do topic modeling? Are, I mean, all the topics are pretty similar. They're all political words. I mean, I can't really see a difference between one, two, three, four, five. I mean, they're all, they're, I see them as more similar than they are different. 
So it might be that for you, you feel like we didn't have enough data that went in to get interesting, discernible topics from one another? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you get a feel, okay, they're talking about energy and oil, and these are the kinds of words they're using in, in the context of that topic. Anything else? Any other questions about topic modeling? I know it sort of a, can be feel like a strange concept, yeah. Let's see. So it was 19, somewhere around 19 volumes, 16 to 19. So it's something like two or 3,000 pages, probably. Okay, so that's a huge number of chunks and a uh -huh. small number of topics. Uh huh, yeah. Yep. Yep, that's a great point. So if we had run this with more topics, our results might have felt more granular or they would have been right, different. Uh-huh. Might have been able to see more different clumps of different kinds of concerns like oil might have broken out from inflation. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Yep, cuz we have quite a bit of text and just a few topics. And so that would be the thing we might consider adjusting. Uh-huh. Yes, yeah. This is the kind of thing where you, I understand your point. You might go, okay, these all seem really similar. What happens if I bump it up to 10 or 20? Yeah. And in the new algorithm that's coming out, you can train a whole bunch, 20, 40, 60, 80, and so you can get a feel for what that so looks you like. Won't be able to chunk larger than I, mean, it's treat, I think it treats every volume as, I forget how it does the chunking, actually. I um, shouldn't say, yeah. <laughs> in here, it's a page, yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So with, that's a know your tool thing. With this tool, we're not seeing what volume these topics were most prevalent in. Some other topic modeling tools allow you to say, oh, okay, this is coming mostly from this volume, or I can see the way the volumes relate to one another or the page. And um, I know Harriet has worked on projects, topic modeling, where as a group, she uses this nice example. They did topic modeling, and then they divided it up. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but they would go back to their original text and think critically about the topics and then the pages they were looking at in order to try to hone in on what they thought were the most relevant topics and things like that. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, so that sort of going back and forth is definitely a one. That's why we talk about topic modeling as one step in the research process because oftentimes researchers are going back and forth. Yeah. Does that answer the question? So with this tool, no, that's a no. Yeah, that's a know your tool thing. Tool. Yeah, yeah. So may, if so, so in this case, it's sort of like okay, I have a feel of the contour of my data. Maybe for the preliminary researcher, that's enough, and we're going to see how somebody used this for preliminary research or for a student, right? Maybe they feel like this is enough for whatever they're doing in their coursework. But for a published paper, if you really wanted to go deep, you might want to run a more robust tool. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. But my question is, like, how confident can I be that this is, um, like, where's the data behind that, where's the numbers behind it, that I can be confident of the validity of this distinction? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Is the, is the underlying data or anything there? I, I've got more background because it's social science research. Than yeah. So in this case, you could go back and look at the public domain volumes and because we were looking at these presidential speeches, and then you could get a feel, too, for what you're seeing. Um, oftentimes, the results of a topic modeling algorithm will give you the probability rankings, but it's that's sort of how you're building your certainty. It's also sort of like know what you're putting in to get a feel for what you're getting out makes sense. Yeah, go ahead. So a slightly different take on this. Given the way this is set up, this, you're saying the volume is going by pages, mm -hmm. where it would seem to be more important because of the format, the genre, to do this by paragraph. Mm -hmm. 
or by speech, right? So there are different ways that a researcher might, they might say, ah, page doesn't make sense for me, maybe I wanted it to be a speech. But you think that that would? Oh, I, I, it was a couple years ago that I took the workshop, so it's possible things have evolved since then, but um, and I've talked to other Matt Gawker mm -hmm. about this, for example. A lot of people are arguing that your chunks have to be exactly the same number of words. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, and that's a good point, yeah. no bearing. No, you're right about that. Mm -hmm. Because what you're trying to get at is the unconscious mm -hmm. or assumptions yep. that are embedded in the text. Yeah, no, that's a great point, yeah. And so, I mean, if you really want to get into it, this, there's a ton of high-level stuff yeah. to read. And I think there's some kind of, I'm not going to pronounce this properly, I'm not going to get it, there's like a three-name kind of Oh, Leighton Dirichlet allocation, yeah. So you can read about what the algorithms are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And topic modeling, I think, it was something that people were really excited about for a while. And then it has started to wane in popularity with, among certain researchers. But it's, I think, really great for conversation in a uh, workshop. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Just briefly, these, these tools only work with data pulled from the Yes. Yep. Yeah. These off-the-shelf ones that are like that, yeah. But like Voyant, you can put your own Yep. Picture. Yep. You, you paste it in a box. And yeah. Yes, so. yeah. Well, Voyant doesn't do topic modeling, but yeah. Oh, right, okay, yeah, but yeah. some of them, sorry, yeah. All right, so we did this. All right, so let's talk about Sam really quickly. So we've been tracking Sam on the uh, more successful track he was on in his research project. But remember at the very beginning, we talked about sort of the fits and starts of doing this kind of research. So before Sam started building out his true creativity corpus, he built a corpus of text um, from the public domain. Um, from 1950 on that included the word creativity in Haunty Trust. And then he used the HTRC topic modeling algorithm to get a feel for what was there. And these are some of the topics that he got. They might be pretty small for you. Um, hopefully you can see them okay. Things, well actually, let me do this, I'm just gonna zoom in. All right, does that help you see it all, though? OK, well, I mean, just ruined it. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah, this is what I get for fussing with the mouse, isn't it? OK, well, we're I'm not going to try to make it bigger for you, because that was a failure. All right, here they are again. OK, so these are some of the topics that he got. What do you think about these topics? So he has things like um, system planning, state, local public programs, uh, children time, school, children education, science, life, human, man, world, nature, body forms, fears, order, form. What do you think about these topics? Yeah. I have kind of a procedural question. Uh-huh. Yeah, so the color doesn't mean much, except it seems like there's some kind of ranking that happens in terms of like th this big one is dark blue. But the size has to do with the prevalence of that word within the topic. So for instance, on our first result from what we did, nothing was a standout. And that means that all of those words occurred at about the same time. Within the context of those other words, yeah. Okay. But sometimes there's one that's like sort of more, it's a more salient term, it's more characteristic of the topic. Is, is there No, I don't think that that order, I don't think that order ha has meaning. So that's just yeah, I'm pretty sure that, okay. that that is not a meaningful I think, order. I think it has to do with the order in terms of the words in the text yeah. as now that it's going through. But I don't think it means like this one is the most important topic or something. But I'm, I, I would want to check myself before I said that with certainty. Yeah. All right, any thoughts about Sam's topics here? Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Can anyone think of why he's saying a lot about state and local government? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So if you're interested in tracking how the term creativity changes over time, do you think that only looking at public domain after 1950 is the best way to build your dissertation? Probably not. Um, yeah. So this goes back. Yeah. 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 Uh huh. And if you were to combine man and man together, it'd be twice as big. <laughs> and so there, there's clearly some kind of rhetoric about you know, the benefit of man mm -hmm. people. Uh huh. But up above on the right, people is the biggest word in a very small topic mm -hmm. over there. So it'd be interesting to explore that more. Yeah. That yeah, that's really interesting. You could see woman and women. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is an example of being familiar with your input text and then also examining your results to see if they make sense. So you could see a less discerning researcher getting this out and writing a chapter of their dissertation with some thoughts about the way that the term creativity has changed to be really um, important in governmental documents or government speak. Uh, but Sam thought, eh, no, this isn't quite right. So um, what he ended up doing was taking a different approach. So this is the sort of start and the stop of this kind of research. Um, so that's when he started using those extracted features files. So um, he was able to get at data that was in copyright and not just in the public domain so that he could make the argument that he wanted to make in his work. All right, so this again, we just throw at it. So if you missed when I was showing you the slide earlier, all of the examples of the tools, this is a good time to start scribbling them down again. Um, so again, these are some other pre-built tools. Uh, which one you would want to recommend depends on the goal for analysis. Something like Voyant and Lexos um, are good web-based tools. They make really pretty, nice, clean visualizations. Uh, Lexos has a text cleaning function built in, which I find quite nice. Um, AntConc for concordances, the Weka again, and then the HTRC algorithms if you want to use HTText specifically. All right, I'm going to see how we're doing on time. Oh, we we're not too far back. Okay, so can you think about the kinds of researchers you might recommend these off-the-shelf tools to? And if you have done this before, this recommending, um, what techniques have you used for um, introducing them to, to researchers? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's great. I did have one question uh -huh. because I was wondering if there's any way, so I, I work with someone who's doing a lot of research on comparing the number of miles of roads in a specific country, and we've used copy, and it'll come up with charts. Yeah, oh, the charts, yeah. Is there any way to pull out the data from charts? Not without going back to the original document and redoing the OCR process. Um, yeah, it's really complicated. Yeah, yeah. I wish it were easier. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? Yeah. Right. Because it gives people, especially if you find ways to use things that seem relevant to them and come right. up with an example that teaches them a little bit of something because there's an awful lot of skepticism uh -huh. now about why should we be investing in this infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is just me speaking for here at the library. There's the infrastructure of providing the content to researchers and then there's the additional infrastructure of training our own staff to understand what the researchers are doing with it, mm -hmm. and both of those are um, are requiring some, some yeah, work. Yeah, yeah. So, so actually having people see the results can be very helpful. 
Yeah, and a good way to say, okay, here's some possibilities, and you don't have to learn how to code right now. That doesn't have to be step one. I need to become a programmer. Yeah. Just what's possible. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So they yeah. The yeah. So they can evaluate others' work better. Yeah. Did you have a? Yeah, I was just going to say, I'm pretty consistent using off-the-shelf tools for anything that's an assignment. Yeah. If, if they, I mean, at the most, they have a semester to work on that. Your average English student doesn't have time to learn how to code in yeah. a semester unless they're very motivated for a project. So anything yeah. that's assignment-based, off-the-shelf tools are great. Yeah, that's great. It's like, what are, what are you? What's the skill you're trying to teach them? Is the skill the interpreting the results? Is the skill the using the tool, or is it learning how to program? And that's sort of a weighing. Oftentimes, you can get bogged down. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so there is, we are moving into a break, so I'm going to go out of the slides, and I'll show you where you can find the list. Um, uh, yeah, so um, the, the unfortunate thing about the way, so it's really hard to tokenize certain languages, so split it into chunks because of the way that the characters are rendered, so especially uh, CJK characters, so Chinese, Japanese, and Korean characters, the tokenization is just bad, um, and the tools don't work as well with them. Um, the topic modeling tool that we have right now works best on English language text, and uh, it does okay, I think, with some non-English text, but if it's non-Roman characters, then it gets really wonky. But I will show you here just the list of languages so you have an idea of what some of those, um, some of the breakdown is like. You can see it's quite a bit of English. And then there's a, quite a bit of German, French, and it sort of tails off from there. Yeah. OK. So we're going to come back to talking about uh, Python a little bit more, thinking again about how you pick up and reuse somebody else's code that they've written. And also, we're going to talk about installing libraries for Python um, that makes it so that you can do research more easily, do work more easily. Uh, so we're going to review some text analysis strategies for advanced researchers to think about when to make skill-appropriate recommendations. Uh, we'll explore text analysis methods in more depth. We'll use an HTRC data set to conduct exploratory data analysis. And then, of course, we'll see what Sam did. All right, so this is where we're going to end up. We're going to create a list of the um, top adjectives in a volume, and then, or a directory of volumes. And then we're going to look at the word count by page in a volume. All right, so what I want us to do is look at these three, no, we have two, two uh, broad areas, key approaches to text analysis, and then uh, you're going to do a little activity in small groups. All right, so sometimes when you're thinking about text analysis, you hear people talking about natural language processing. Is that a term that y'all are familiar with? OK, so natural language processing is uh, using computers to understand the meaning, relationships, and semantics within human, human language text. So some specific methods are things like named entity extraction. So what are the names of the people, places, organizations, the dates that can be um, a certain kind of um, entity extracted that appear in a text? Um, sentiment analysis is another kind of NLP processing. So what does this text, um, what is the mood or the feeling of this text? Is it positive? Is it negative? Um, and then there's also stylometry. So um, what can we learn from measuring features of style in this text that tell us something about the work? And then in this other bucket, we can think about machine learning as another approach to text analysis. Um, so machine learning is training computers to recognize patterns. So remember, text analysis, we're all about patterns, right? So um, two specific methods that we mention are topic modeling and naive Bayes classification. So topic modeling um, is what we just looked at, obviously. Um, and topic modeling doesn't take much human input. It's unsupervised. So you throw some data at the computer, you set some parameters, and you get something out, and then you think about your results. Um, but that training piece, the computer is doing it on its own without much information from you, guidance from you, about what to do or how to do it. I mean, it's just running a process. That's specified. 
um, we can contrast that with naive base classification, which is supervised machine learning. So in supervised machine learning, the human tells the computer some information. It, it keys it up, it precedes it with some information, and then it asks to learn based on the information that it was provided. So that's supervised machine learning. And naive base classification is an example of supervised machine learning. So a, a kind of research question you might ask are, which of the categories that I have named does this text belong to? So you could say, hey computer, here is some fiction written by women in Britain in the 1900s. And here is some fiction written by women in the US in the 2000s. Here is a blob of text, a whole mass of text. You go through them and tell me if it was written by a woman in 19th, uh, yeah, 1900s in 19th century Britain, I'm messing with my examples now, or in the 2000s in the US, that was our two groups, right? So you tell me based on what I told you was true for this smaller subset, what is true about the larger group. So that's naive base classification. All right, so you're gonna look back at those examples that we read way back this morning, um, are those research examples that you read through, and in pairs or by yourself if you want to, um, but we prefer you work in small groups if you don't mind. Uh, go through and identify the broad area and then the specific method. And again, these broad areas are NLP and machine learning. And then the specific methods um, are named entity extraction, sentiment analysis, and stylometry, and topic modeling and naive Bayes classification. And if you need to go back to look at the research examples again to remember, there's a link here that's up on the screen. What's the broad area for the Rowling and Galbraith example? Okay, so that's our specific method. That's great. And what's the broad area? Natural language processing. So to do NLP, we need the words in order on the page. And we often leave in, um, for stylometry at least, we don't take the stop words out. They're kept in because those tell us something about the writing style, which can help us figure out who wrote something. <laughs> All right, what about significant themes in 19th century literature? What's the broad area? Machine, Machine learning, good. And the specific method? Uh, Great. All right, and then the emergence of literary diction. What's the broad area? Machine good. And the specific method? Yeah, naive Bayes classification, yeah. So they said, here's some fiction, here's some poetry, here's some prose. Now you tell us which category the text belongs to, and then they were able to chart out this change over time. All right, so throughout the day, we've come back to a few different ways of looking at a text analysis workflow. So this is another way that you can think about how the research process progresses, um, just sort of flipped in a new way. So you can think about the workflow as going like this. You have raw text. And then you do some preparation, so you uh, deduplicate, you get rid of some of the pages, uh, you get your corpus ready to go, um, you do the normalization, the cleaning, um, and then we translate the text into features, and that's where we are now. So remember, we're getting the text into something that can be counted. It's all about counting. Um, so we need something the computer can count. So those are the features, and we're going to talk about a data set that's all features and what that means in a second. And then you can plug that in for algorithmic use. So uh, within HTRC, uh, we can think about features as they relate to a data set that's called the Extracted Features Data Set. And Harriet mentioned this really briefly early on. We were talking about SAM, like, oh, hey, SAM downloaded Extracted Features. So now we're circling back around to that. So the Extracted Features Data Set is a downloadable data set of 15.7 million volumes from HathiTrust, so including both the public domain and the in-copyright data. And they are meant for the researcher who wants to work on their own machine or outside of the R systems, um, who is interested in having a little bit of the processing of the text done on their behalf, and I'll say more about that in a second, and who is also able and willing to work with bags of words. So you can't do NLP with these because the word order is not there anymore, but you can do any analysis that requires bag of words. So this slide is out of date, should be 15.7, and I forget what the number billion of pages is, but it's a lot. 
All right, so sometimes we call it EF, extracted features. So these features are selected data and metadata from um, every page in every volume within that 15.7 million volume snapshot of the corpus. And they're extracted from the raw text and the metadata for those volumes. And they're meant to position the researcher to begin their analysis. So a lot of text analysis starts or proceeds with this translation into features. And so by providing the text as features, HTRC is one, poising the researcher to begin their study and also Two, making it so that the release of this massive data set um, is non-consumptive, so the text is not recreatable. So this is one solution for providing access, a derived data set to end copyright text. All right, so these are what the features look like. So there is, they're in JSON format, which you saw earlier when we used the bibliographic API, what uh, JSON looks like. How many of you are familiar with JSON? Great, so if you can read XML, you can read JSON. JSON is structured, it's nested like XML is. It's just less verbose. There's no opening and closing tags. You just see the blue text before the colon. Um, it's, it's, I think it's nicer to read. Okay, so it's JSON format and there is one JSON file per volume in that 15.7 million volume snapshot. And then within every one of those JSON files, there's a hierarchy and a structure, and that's what we're running through now. So at the top of the file, there are per volume features. So bibliographic metadata about the volume. Um, and then there is information like what language is this volume that the cataloger said that it was. Um, the some identifiers, the title, things like that, some dates. And then nested under that, for every page in the volume, there is more metadata. So there are f per page features. So there's the page sequence. So this doesn't uh, correspond to the um, page number at the bottom of the page, but it corresponds to the scan order. So if they scanned all of the you know, opening pages, which they often do, then it would start with um, 00001, and that might be the cover, it might be the inside page, et cetera. Okay, so the sequence, and then there's computationally inferred metadata. So this isn't the bibliographic metadata, this is metadata that was inferred in the process of creating these features files. Um, so there are things like how many words, lines, and sentences appeared on that page, and how many of them were empty. So then you could say like, huh, look, here are all of the places in this file where the page is mostly empty, Maybe it has an image on it. Maybe it's the beginning or the end of a chapter. And you could start to use these features to understand the contours of your data. And then there's also um, computationally inferred meta uh, language sorry, on the, at the page level. So the computer will say, this page is in English, this page is in French, which is more nuanced than you might get from just a, a larger catalog record. OK. So then. We are like moving our way down the hierarchy. And so then within each page section, we break the page up into um, three pieces, header, body, and footer. So you can see the way that we have this highlighted here, yellow across the top for the header, and then the body is outlined in red. And then you'll see some of these things that might get picked up. Okay, so for each of these pieces, for each page in the volume, the header, body, and footer, there is line, empty line, and sentence count. So you have it for the whole page, and then you have it for the section. Then you have the counts of beginning and end line characters. And then you have token counts. And what are tokens? Words. words. OK, so then we have words and word counts. And so you'll see here that we have things, OK, token count, line count, empty line count. Um, we're moving down. And then we have uh, all of the tokens that start. And you'll see that they're tagged with a part of speech. This is so that the part of speech information isn't lost when the bag of words is created. So we're keeping some of that meaning there. And you'll see that they are marked with that code, that two letter code, which is from the Pen Tree Bank. Are any of you familiar with the Pen Tree Bank? Okay, so um, this is a standard linguistics coding system for languages, or I'm sorry, for parts of speech. So JJ is adjective, NNP is proper noun, and so this provides some additional context about the information. But look, we have all of the words that appeared on this page, just not the order in which they appeared. 
okay. So you could identify the parts of a book, you could do topic modeling, um, you could classify the volumes, sort of like that example we saw where they were saying this is fiction, this is nonfiction prose. All right, any questions about that? We're sort of like, zoo, zoo, we're gonna come back to it in a second, yeah. Volume, yes, okay. yeah, right. yeah. So they take the all of the plain text that constitutes a volume, and then they process it and they spit out a JSON file that corresponds to the volume. And then within that JSON file, that file is broken up into the sections. So you're with the data Yes, but you don't have to get all 15.7 million. Sure. Yeah, okay. Okay. Right. I say that as a warning because if you did, it would like. Your computer, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's the number of times it occurred in that section of the page. Yeah, yeah. And we had a question earlier, I can't remember who asked it, I think that you did in the front about stripping away the headers and the footers and what if you didn't actually want it gone? So that was you, right? So in this data set, the idea is, well, we prep the researcher so that if they want to take it out, they can, but if for some reason you think that your data is less likely to have a header and a footer line and you want to keep it in, or you think that it's important for your work for whatever reason, we haven't taken it all away. It's still there so you could knit the pieces back together. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I still want to make sure I understand what it's in. So it's one JSON file. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And then page by page. Yeah, it says, here's page one, here's some information about it, and page one, it, the header has this, the body has this, the footer has this. And all these words. Yes, yep, and here's page two, and it has a header, body, it, footer. It doesn't have the actual text. Yeah, it has the words and the number of times that they occurred, part of speech tagged. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so we're going to sort of, we're doing like a, zigzag here. So we're going to talk a little bit more about do-it-yourself text analysis. So um, some researchers will not want to use off-the-shelf tools. They are just not going to want to do it. They're great for getting their feet wet, but they, they are just not going to be satisfied and they're going to want more. And those are the just give me the data and let me do my work kinds of people. And we are going to talk about what kinds of tools those kinds of researchers use for their analysis. So that kind of researcher wants more control over the processes of their analysis. Uh, they want to know the intimate details of what's happening and they really want to be able to parameter, parameterize um, and set the specifications for the work that they're doing. And so this do-it-yourself approach is often a mix-and-match sort of um, combination of various tools, like programming languages you can think of as a tool um, that a researcher is going to put together, and they might use one tool at one point in the research and another tool at another time. All right, so this toolkit is researcher dependent. There are wars fought over Python versus R, and people have strong feelings about it. Um, and so it's really, it's about what the researcher wants. There's no right tool necessarily. It's really researcher driven. Um, and generally to be able to do this kind of work, you need some understanding of statistics because remember, it's all counting. Um, so you need to understand what your results are. Um, and so this leads me to the point that it often draws on expert collaborators. So we sometimes see in digital humanities and text analysis research teams where you have people pairing up in collaborations or partnerships where someone is crunching data or analyzing data uh, in combination with somebody else. And the toolkit consists of command line tools and programming languages. All right, so what are those tools? So some uh, general command line tools that are commonly used, and by command line tool, I mean you install it on your computer and you run it from the command line, but you're not doing computer programming. So mallet is one tool we talked about earlier. That's a command line tool. And there are set sort of instructions that you follow that are mallet, and you run it from the command line. So you say like, mallet do this, mallet do that, and you feed data in, you set parameters, and you get an output. And mallet's good for topic modeling, and it can also do some kinds of classification. Uh, some researchers use this, they use Stanford's suite of NLP tools for natural language processing. Um, Mallet and Stanford's NLP are both Java-based, and I think both of them have a, a, graph ooh, a graphical user interface that you could use um, if you didn't want to use it on the command line, but oftentimes these sorts of researchers are using them on the command line. 
OK, and then there are code libraries. So someone asked earlier about code libraries. So this is the time when we're talking about that. All right, so part of programming is reusing code. All right, so no one is starting from zero when they're programming. You've got a computer. It has an operating system. Like something has been done for you generally before you get started, right? So just think about the library as a crutch, a support tool, a, an implement that allows you